certainly. So it's important that you understand that being a caregiver is a very important role that we wouldn't be able to be without in our society. So now that you are a caregiver, now what do you do? The important thing is that you pull together and figure out how you're going to move forward now. Because even though it's something that has fallen into your lap, after about a year or a year and a half, you start to think, I don't see any light at the end of this tunnel. It's important to take responsibility for the new role that you find yourself in as a family caregiver. Figure out what you can do and what you cannot do. You need to determine what the care receiver can do and cannot do. Learn about the illness or the disease that is causing this problem so that you better understand what's happening. Be realistic about your expectations. You know, oftentimes before this situation happened, you might have had a things to do list that had 10, 12, 15 items on it for one day. But now you'd be lucky if you have five or six items on there and maybe get one or two of them done. So setting real expectations is important. Reach out to find out what resources, programs, and services are available. You can contact the Department of Aging for information and assistance on how we can better help your family. And remember to accept help. Oftentimes you'll find family and friends that offer to help. And you just say, okay, thank you. But take them up on it. Say, really, what would be better for you? A weekday or a weekend? Would be better in the morning or in the afternoon? And then call and take their help. Ask your friends, your relatives, other family members to see if they can help. Together, you can get very successful at family caregiving. We had a chance to visit with the teacher and the student, Joanne McCullough and Eileen Popkin. Is, is the movement, I mean, it, we're constantly moving and learning, which is good for your mind. You, they're learning new dances all the time, new steps especially in TAP, they're learning new steps all the time, and they have to remember them, and that's great for your mind. You're supposed to do that in folk dancing. They're supposed to remember the steps. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't, but it is good. Exercise really gets you moving. Illegally parked cars? Call 311, the toll free number for non emergency services. 311, your one call to City Hall. Illegal dumping? Call 311, the toll free number for non emergency services. 311, your one call to City Hall. Moving is so much of who we are. It's easy to take it for granted. Multiple sclerosis stops people from moving. We exist to make sure it doesn't. Join the movement, the National Multiple Sclerosis Society at nationalmssociety.org. Welcome back to Aging in LA. We are about to visit with Ellen Oppenberg, who has a unique and uh, new service for seniors. Ellen, welcome. Thank tell you. me, tell me the name first of this new company and what your services you're offering. Thank you very much. The company's name is Time Savers for Seniors, mm -hmm. and we offer A through Z in terms of services. What we try to do is make the lives of seniors and their families that care for them easier. Uh, so what that means is that incorporates the idea of taking of going on errands right. uh, for the seniors and their families, for doing event planning, for doing uh, transitional living exchanges, whereby if the uh, the senior is moving from a home that they know so well to another place, we will be on the receiving end making everything warm and beautiful. Well, I, I'm thinking this is a, could be a great comfort to people who are caring for an elderly senior who can't always be there or maybe live across the country because uh, I learned my lessons in this. 
Absolutely, <laughs> as did we. And, yeah. and if I can say, that's exactly why this company was, was founded. Uh, a friend of mine who just lost her mother, I lost my father last year and my mother prior to that, we lamented one day that, you know, how we felt so squeezed between yes. generations. You know, raising our own families and our having our spouses and having full-time jobs and all of that and still wanting to be everything to everybody and, and, and really just being with our parents rather than always having to run errands for them but having some more quality time than right. that. So we decided that we needed a service like this because we didn't know one existed. Uh, when we looked, there wasn't one. Anybody who's been involved with these care issues mm -hmm. knows that it's complex, it's ever-changing, as, you know, one year's problems are not the same as the next. So do you help families anticipate those needs as well? Absolutely. I mean, having lived through these experiences and knowing what it's like to go through the system and the mazes and what have you, we actually feel that we're, we're pretty authoritarian in that way, that we know what to do. Right. And we, we also do a referral service. We also do internet searches for families when they don't have the time. So the opposite end of what we do is not only for the seniors, but also for their families. So if they have to be at Aunt Mary's birthday, party but they also have to get little Johnny's birthday party together right. we'll help them out with that right as well. now before we run out of time uh, again the name of the company and how pe how can people contact you time savers for seniors time um, savers for seniors we're serving the San Fernando Valley and the Ventura County area okay. and 818 832-8526 or timesaversforseniors.com thanks so much for joining thank us you. this is a real thank treat you very for us. much thanks. my pleasure well, Kathy, tell me what we're seeing here with these young kids serving uh, the seniors. Um, you know, this was a program that was started um, as a true intergenerational program. And it's an offshoot of the lunch program where the kids come in and serve lunch to the seniors, which is a workability program. We decided to take it to another level and incorporate now a culinary class, which also is going to have a built-in bakery component where people are going to learn how to start their own business, baking, selling product, um, and truly working all intergenerational um, components of the piece of the model. Well, yeah, kids in high school have to have community service hours. Can they get them here? Absolutely. They can get community service hours. They can get high school credit, elective hours for their technical um, electives. And aside from all of that, which I think is the most important piece, is that they get job skills. They get hands-on training, and they get socialization skills, which everybody benefits from. Here's your green milk. Thank you. Enjoy your lunch, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. When you think about the, the size of the community mm -hmm. of seniors coming into the market, mm -hmm. we're going to need youngsters uh, in the, in the um, job place right. who are able to take care of seniors and understand right. their needs. And it allows them the opportunity to get all those components that we just talked about. Mm -hmm. And you know what? Who doesn't love food? Using food as a medium to you know, create you know, jobs and training and socialization right. for all generations is truly, you know, to me, the, the best part of the whole the whole. Well, thing. I agree. This, this is the chicken soup. <laughs> exactly, exactly, exactly. Exactly. And now it's time to hear from Brenda Barnett from the Department of Animal Services another of the special services available here in Los Angeles. And I'm delighted to be able to tell you about a special program that we have, which is Senior Pets for Senior Citizens. And what we know about having companion animals in our lives is that they make us happier, they make us smile, they reduce our blood pressure, and they greet us when we come home from wherever we've been, whether it's a walk or whatever. The other thing that when, as we get older and we get a little bit more sedentary in our lives, uh, having a companion animal probably increases your exercise. You'll get up, you'll take care of your pet, you'll take your companion animal for a little walk. Uh, if it's a kitty, you'll clean your litter box. And when you remember to feed your companion animal, that's a reminder that it's time for you to eat too. So, you know, we just know that having a companion animal is the best way to enrich your life and to enrich their life because they need you too. Each year at Los Angeles Animal Services, we have over 50,000 companion animals that come through our six shelters. So we have a selection that you won't believe until you come and see it. We have kitties of all ages, from uh, kittens to mature cats. I actually would recommend a mature cat. They're a whole lot easier. We have dogs from puppies to mature dogs. Again, I would recommend a mature dog because they're a little bit easier to handle and take care of. 
and we have love in all size packages. So come on down to Los Angeles Animal Services, any one of our six shelters, meet our amazing animals. We have love just waiting for you. We are visiting now with Ann Love from the DMV and we have a subject that's very important to the seniors in and around Los Angeles. And welcome, so uh, thank you for coming here. Thanks. You are the ombudsman for seniors uh, on behalf of their interest vis-a-vis -vis the DMV, correct? Yes, as the senior driver ombudsman, I work with seniors who have concerns, inquiries regarding uh, transactions at the Department of Motor Vehicles. Mm -hmm. I also spend a large part of my time making presentations to senior groups about safe senior mobility. Well, what are, the, what are some of the things you do? I mean, do you address uh, uh, senior citizen groups yes. uh, when they get together so you can kind of inform them of what's coming? I, I think the idea is to bring to mind that there are physical and mental changes that accompany the aging process. Yes. And those changes do affect skills necessary for safe driving. Yes. And make recommendations how they might use resources, uh, modify driving behaviors, so that they can continue their driving life uh, for a little longer. One of the first steps of being a safe driver is recognizing that there are changes. Yes. We each age differently, so it's important that each person do a self-assessment to determine where they are. DMV has published a Senior Guide for Safe Driving. Very good. And in that guide is a self-assessment tool that mm -hmm. helps seniors go through their skills, their impairments, and determine just where they are and the kinds of modifications they might need to make. Moving forward, you mentioned to me before we started the formal part of this interview that people need to do some planning. They do for retirement, but they don't plan for those years when they stop driving. How many years do most people go after they lose their privileges? Most people will outlive their ability to be a safe driver for seven to ten years. Seven to ten years, did you hear that? So. What we'd like to do is take it in stages. Start with the self-assessment. Recognize what resources are available, whether it's adaptive equipment, whether it's driver retraining, whether mm -hmm. it's rehabilitation retraining, driving modification, which right. may mean eliminating certain things, changing routes so that they are off heavy thoroughfares and onto less traffic, right. maybe eliminating night driving, freeway driving, those kinds of changes. Uh, DMV even offers an area restriction, uh -huh. which says someone might drive in a particular area. Right, and go to and from the market uh, and a well-marked route. Yes. Um, and I can understand that some, I, I guess there's no easy way to say this, but the time does come and it is very painful within families when you have to tell dad or grandpa, you just have to give me your keys. Well, we want the message, we want dad and mom to get the message that driving is not forever. Mm -hmm. So when that time comes, it won't be a shock to them that they're no longer able to drive. Right. We want them to accept the fact that driving is not forever, to become familiar with uh, alternate transportation that's right. available. That's very important because we do have a lot of little companies and government services, whether it's paratransit, access transit, things, numbers yes. that you can call. There are taxi vouchers, there's uh, some seniors who may not be able to drive, may still be able to use public transportation. Right. And there are reduced fees associated with that. So there's a lot available and we recommend that seniors become familiar with what's available in their community right. before they reach the point that suddenly they can't drive today. But this is such a large topic and so important to the seniors in and around Los Angeles. Uh, I can't thank you enough and love for joining us. The Senior Ombudsman for the DMV, they have a booklet available for you. So. You know the uh, address, www.dmv.ca.gov, okay? Pick this up because it's important. Maybe you can extend that freedom of the road a little bit longer. Thank you. Thanks, Ann.
And now it's time for our health checkup with Dr. Gill. We're going to talk about memory loss today. In my practice with the senior citizen population, th that seems to be a very common complaint of people. Uh, unfortunately, what we're finding is that they're waiting until way too late to do something about it. They're waiting until uh, they're, they're losing blocks of memory in, 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 their, in their life. And really where it should start is these short-term memory losses, like where did I last leave my keys? What did I have for lunch yesterday? Uh, you know, what, what was the phone number that I dialed this morning to, to someone who just gave me their phone number? This is where treating memory loss should begin. And so it's not a question of, uh, I can't remember these blocks of time way in the past. It really starts with short-term memory loss first. And perhaps what we should do is go over this mechanism of short-term memory loss and, and how it really occurs first. What I've got here is, is a model of a brain. This is the back half of the brain. And on different parts of the brain, we're just going to talk about one part in particular. It's called the, the parietal lobe. It's right over in here and the temporal lobe. The temporal lobe is where a part of the brain sits called the hippocampus. Now the hippocampus is what's very responsible for memory loss. And different things can affect your hippocampus. For example, a, a high cortisol, which is a hormone released by your adrenal glands, is very toxic to the hippocampus. So if you're under stress or if you have adrenal gland dysfunction, it could strongly affect your hippocampus and you'll find you start getting these lapses in short-term memory. The other part is this temporal lobe here where the hippocampus sits. What you might find is maybe your smell has changed. Maybe you, maybe you smell things that other people don't smell. Or perhaps you don't smell things that other people smell. That tells us that there's a portion of this brain here called the temporal lobe that's affected. And because that hippocampus sits right inside that temporal lobe, that tells me that there could be a potential neurological problem here in your temporal lobe and or hippocampus, which is affecting your memory. So how do we fix this? Well, one of the most common things that occur because of this short-term memory loss is toxicity to the brain through inflammation. Now, what do I mean by that? There's literally fire inside your brain. Now, how do you get fire inside your brain? Well, if you don't have a great diet, that's one of the reasons why you might have fire inside your brain. One of the most common things, though, is blood sugar. Blood sugar spikes and blood sugar drops. So one of the easiest things you can do to possibly help out your, mem your memory loss is eat regularly. Right? Watch your high sugar foods at the end of the night. Start eating every couple hours. Don't skip meals. That's one of the easiest things you could do. Another thing is take anti-inflammatory herbal supplements like fish oils. Fish oils are one of the easiest things you can do to calm down inflammation in your brain. Okay? Brain cells hate inflammation and brain cells hate blood sugar spikes. So keep your blood sugar under control. Watch you know, what you're eating. Okay? Don't eat the most obvious things out there that you know you shouldn't eat. And really just watch the inflammatory products that you're ingesting. Kathy, Larry, thank you so much for sharing your day with us. It's been a wonderful visit. And I hope you enjoyed it too. And thanks for joining us with Aging in L.A. G'day, Troy McCubbin from North Hollywood. You're watching LA City View, Channel 35, our city, our channel. Good morning, Los Angeles, and welcome to the City Council.
Good morning, Los Angeles, and welcome to the City Council meeting for Friday, September 30th, 2011. We are here in the John Farrow Council Chambers, and welcome to members of the public who have joined us here today. We have a very uh, special set of uh, presentations that will begin shortly, including Day of the Horse here in Los Angeles, a commemoration of the Braceros who are here as they come into Council Chambers as well. Uh, U.S. Water Prize, Adopt a Pet, and uh, the good old Sherman Brothers who are with us as well. We want to thank everybody who has made time to be here, and we appreciate your presence here in Council Chambers. We're also broadcast live on Channel 35, which broadcasts these meetings live on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Fridays at 10 a.m. We are also uh, shown on the Internet through our city's homepage at lacity.org. Uh, which is a great way to not only catch our live meetings, but you can check out our archived footage of all of our past meetings for your convenience. Also online are all of our agendas, um, descriptions of the material that we're voting on, and the supporting material that council members receive is also available for the general public for uh, your uh, indulgence and for your edification as well. We are also available through telephone by calling in uh, to Council Phone, a service of the city, a number that you can listen into council meetings, and that number is 213-621-CITY. It's 213-621-CITY. You can listen into the council meetings or any of our committee meetings. Uh, finally, you can always come here live in person, and uh, you can also uh, go to our remote uh, city hall facilities in Van Nuys and San Pedro City Halls. Uh, if those are closer to where you live and want to save some time and uh, reduce some pollution and, and uh, traffic on the streets, San Pedro and Van Nuys uh, have not only facilities where you can watch the meetings, but you can also testify remotely. I want to thank those council members who are here on time. Council members Englander, Wiesar, Koretz, uh, Perry, Rosendahl, Wesson, and Zine. As soon as we have ten members, we will have a quorum and begin the meeting. Council members Cardenas, Koretz, and Labonge are not expected in today, so we're just awaiting Council Members Alicon, uh, Parks, and Reyes. Um, each Friday we have special presentations, as I mentioned, that uh, commemorate important dates and organizations and people who are making a difference here in the City of Los Angeles, and so we will be uh, beginning shortly. Uh, Mr. Wiesar, are you ready to, to begin with the, the presentation for the Braceros? So I'd like to recognize uh, from Council District 14, Council Member Jose Wiesar for our first presentation. Well, good morning, uh, colleagues and public, and Mr. Rosenthal. How are you doing? Uh, good. How are you, Bill? Oh, you look great in that hat. You look like a bracero. Hey, we got to get a good there, yeah. I love it. We've got the, the Day of the Horse and the Braceros together, united by sombreros you think it's on both sides. Okay. Thank you very much. And after uh, my comments, we will need a uh, Spanish interpreter for some Spanish comments. But uh, good morning, everyone. And it's an honor to be here this morning to honor the memory of the Mexican Bracero workers who came to the United States to work in this nation's agriculture and transportation industries. Uh, I am joined this morning by Mr. Baldomero Capiz, president of La Unión Binacional de Ex Braceros, and other members of the organization for a very special presentation in celebration of the International Bracero Day. We've been doing this, this presentation every year for the last four years because it is an important part of our American history that we don't hear enough about. The workers from the Bracero program helped our country in its time of need during World War II and afterwards. When our country went to war, we had a shortage of American workers. So in 1942, the Mexican government and the United States established a guest worker program which became known as the Bracero program. Men left behind their wives, children, and parents to come to the United States to work on U.S. farms and railroads. One of those men was my father, Simon Huizar Banuelos, and I'm very proud that my father participated in the Braceta program and contributed to this country in its time of need. As a Mexican immigrant myself, I am also proud that over the program's 22-year history, 
More than 4 million Mexican citizens answered our great nation's call to work here in the United States. And let's be honest, they often endured harsh conditions, substandard housing, and working conditions were not as hospitable as we would think. But these Mexican nationals came and we owe them a debt of gratitude for their work and for helping our great country. The Mexican government has begun to pay money that is owed to these workers, money that was withheld from their paychecks with the promise that they would later receive it. This comes after a settlement uh, for a class action lawsuit filed here in the United States. But as I'm sure these workers will tell you, getting that money isn't always an easy process with the eligibility requirements and documentation. I would hope that we could work to expedite this process so that more eligible workers could get paid the money they, that they rightfully earned and deserve. Beyond that, it is important to recognize that their history is our history. That my father's story, like the men you see here with me today, was shared by millions of men and their families, and it is something we need to recognize and acknowledge. Some have mentioned that this migration that occurred at the time, at the height of this program, perhaps can be one of the largest migrations that has ever happened in the history of the world. To that end, La Union Binacional de Expresseros is working on collecting keys, copper, and pennies to melt down, to erect a statue, a monument honoring Expresseros, as you can see a replica sitting here uh, next to me. I think the city of Los Angeles is the perfect city to honor these hardworking men, being that we are home to the second largest population of Mexicans outside of Mexico City. So with that, uh, let me introduce to you Baldomero Capiz, who has been with us for these last four years as we honor the Braceros living here in Los Angeles and recognize them and thank them for contributing to this great country and knowing that their struggles, their hard work, their contributions shall never be forgotten. Uh, Mr. Baldomero Capiz. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Buenos días. Mi nombre es Baldomero Capiz. Soy presidente de la Unión Binacional de Braceros 1942-1967. Good morning. My name is Baldomero Capiz and I am the president of Unión Binacional de Braceros 1942-1967. Honorables miembros del Concilio de la Ciudad de Los Ángeles, California. Honorable members of the City of Los Angeles Council. Queremos agradecer al concejal por el distrito 14. We want to thank council member of district 14. José Huizar por el gran apoyo a la campaña de donaciones, llaves, penis, cobre para la estatua del bracero. We want to thank council member José Huizar for his great support for the a, a donation campaign of keys, pennies, and copper for the Bracero Statue. Este proyecto se inició enero primero de 2011 en un lugar muy concurrido por la comunidad mexicana, la Plaza Olmera. This project started on uh, January 1st, 2011, in a place that is uh, pretty much assisted by the Mexican community and is the Placita Olvera. Y la presentación de esta estatua, como ustedes lo ven, es una réplica en miniatura y que uh, refleja al hombre trabajando en el campo. The presentation of this statue, as you can see, is a replica of a bracero working on the fields. It's in miniature. En su mano derecha tiene un azadón corto. In his right hand, he has a small knife. En la parte izquierda tiene una, un broccoli. O... On the left hand, he has a piece of broccoli. Y es la forma como ellos trabajaban por 8 a 12 o 14 horas en aquellos años. This is the way that they used to work between 8, uh, 12, 14 hours a day on those years. La estatura de la estatua será de 2 metros, equivalente a 5 pies, 8 pulgadas. The height of the statue is going to be 2 meters, which is equivalent to 8 feet and 5 feet. Eight inches. El costo de la estatua será un 
una cantidad de 25 mil dólares. The statue is going to cost um, around 25,000 dollars. Por aquí tenemos al escultor que es Ricardo Lugo. We have the sculpture mexicano. here, a Mexican sculpture, Ricardo Lugo. Y los materiales de cobre que se requieren, se requerirán 900 libras. And the copper material that we are going to need is 900 pounds. Y lo queremos que se establezca aquí en la ciudad de Los Ángeles, California. And we want, we want to remain here in the city of Los Angeles, California. Honorable Concilio. Honor, honorable Council. Los invitamos a apoyar este proyecto. We invite you to support this project. Y a celebrar por cuarto año consecutivo este domingo 2 de octubre, el Día Internacional del Bracero, a las 12 p.m. en la Plaza Olvera, están todos cordialmente invitados. Uh, all of you are cordially invited to come and celebrate on October the 2nd. The International uh, the International del Bracero is going to be at 12 p.m. and it's going to be at the Placita Olvera. Muchas gracias y Dios les bendiga. Thank you very much and God bless you. Gracias. Muchísimas gracias, Baldomero Capiz, y a todos los braceros y las familias. Les damos las gracias por todo lo que hicieron por este país. Y aquí estamos con la ciudad de Los Ángeles, diciéndoles que nunca se nos vamos a olvidar todo el sacrificio que ustedes hicieron para estar aquí a contribuir a este país. Este país es uno de los más poderosos en todo el mundo, pero también por el esfuerzo los mexicanos que ayudaron en ese tiempo durante la Segunda Guerra Mundial. Felicidades y muchísimas gracias. And finally, I'd like to present uh, to the Unión Binacional de Expresados a certificate of recognition from the city of Los Angeles. And I just thank uh, the Braceros who are with us here today for their sacrifices, for the contributions they have made, because after all, uh, during World War II and what came after that, the United States was able to position itself as one of the most powerful countries in the world. And the Mexicans who came as Braceros contributed to that effort so that we enjoy the quality of life that we have today. They fed our families and our soldiers in the time of need, and many Mexican agricultural workers continue to do that today. If you look at some of the film of the Braceros who came, and you look at the substandard living, the long hours they worked, many of them going back to Mexico, uh, earning nothing because they would come here, get paid very little, pay for expenses and rations and all that just covered with the little they were making. Uh, they were here uh, working those long hours um, and sometimes didn't make anything going back to their native land. Uh, they, they've done a lot for our country and I don't think that our history has really captured their contributions and captured the sacrifices they made uh, to be here. And many families in Mexico not having a father, not having a parent, because they're here working in the United States. This story must be told. It will be told. And having this statue here placed in the city of Los Angeles once completed will help tell that story. So on behalf of the city of Los Angeles, I'd like to present this certificate of recognition to Baldomero Capiz and all the, the braceros who are here from all parts of Mexico, from Zacatecas, Jalisco, Guanajuato, Michoacán, Morelia, All over Mexico, Braceros came. Durango, Chihuahua, Chihuahua, uh, <laughs> grandmother, grandfather, your grandfather, yeah. grandfather from right. our council Alisco. president, <laughs> Alisco ya dije también. De todas partes de México, all of Mexico responded to that call. Thank you very much on behalf of the city of Los Angeles. Gracias. Thank you very much, Mr. Wiesa. Felicidades y gracias por venir a todos. Uh, we want to thank everybody who came uh, from the uh, ex Braceros. Uh, next, I'd like to recognize, if she is ready, Councilwoman Jan Perry from Council District 9. Is she ready for the U.S. Water Prize?
Get, let's get everybody, get everybody up here for the uh, water prize presentation and uh, actually need my notes. Ooh, let's see. You can borrow mine. Uh, let me borrow yours for a minute. <laughs> thank you. I, somebody, my person walked up, must be in the back room. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you. All right, got him. Okay, you've got the cert. Is this everybody? Yes. Come, come close. Come, come. It's a good sized room. It's good. It's good. Come up here. Come, come close. Tall ones in the front. Tall ones in the yes. front. Yeah, tall people in the front. Come on. Come on. Tall people. Yeah. Tall people. Yeah, yeah. Put the tall people in the front. Okay, come on. Come on, come on, come on. Come on. Get close. Why, why Snuggle up, people. Yeah, come on, come on. Please. Seriously. So, all right. Adele, come on. Is that everybody? Okay. Great. This is a proud day that I recognize individuals who are leading the city of Los Angeles into a more green and sustainable future. In 2006, the city council adopted the city of Los Angeles's Water Integrated Resources Plan, which was to be implemented and led by the city's Bureau of Sanitation. Designed as the first stakeholder driven process with engagement from numerous city departments the water IRP has since served as a blueprint for the city's other green initiatives. To date, the Bureau of Sanitation has implemented several strategies designed to conserve, reuse, and reduce the city's water consumption. City departments, including Public Works, Water and Power, Planning and others have been working collaboratively to impl implement the, the integrated plan for the city's water, wastewater, stormwater, and recycled water systems. This cooperation has been key in achieving a 19.2% overall conservation rate of the city's water since 2006. Strategies that have been implemented include the development of the Low Impact Development Ordinance, just passed it the other day, the realization of the Downspout Disconnect Program, and the implementation of best management practices at numerous city facilities and projects. In addition to significant progress, in addition, significant progress has been made with the city's recycled water master planning documents, leading to an increase in recycled water use with new customers, and purple pipe projects. This hard work and collaboration was recognized and rewarded this year when the very prestigious Clean Water America Alliance awarded its inaugural U.S. Water Prize to the City of Los Angeles for planning, integrating, and incorporating innovative green infrastructure approaches to water reuse and recovery. The success of our city's water IRP serves as a very real reminder of what can be accomplished when city departments work together to accomplish such an important goal. So today, we join together to salute the city's water IRP team and our own Bureau of Sanitation for making the city of Los Angeles one of the only five recipients nationwide to receive the inaugural U.S. Water Prize Award. Get, let's give them a hand. And now it is my pleasure to invite the director of the Bureau of Sanitation, Enrique Saldivar, to say a few words and uh, we'll recognize the uh, members of the team. Thank you, Councilmember Perry. It is indeed an honor for me to uh, share this tremendously prestigious prize uh, and recognition at the national level. Uh, it's the first inaugural uh, recognition of any entity. If you think back of the IRP starting 12 years ago, it was uh, pioneering, uh, innovative, and now being recognized 12 years later. I think it's uh, a tremendous pride for our city. Uh, I want to thank uh, Council Member Perry for recognizing. I want to thank the Council and our Mayor uh, for providing the leadership, leadership for us to be able to do this. In particular, I want to recognize the team members who are many uh, across many departments, 
uh, including stakeholders and residents, consultants. But just quickly, I'll mention some of the names. Glenn Bailey, Ashok Khanna, Judy Wilson. Boy, Judy Wilson is my predecessor. We're recognizing her. <laughs> she was, uh, she's, it started under her leadership. So anyway, uh, and we have many others, but in particular, one person who has transcended this from the very beginning until now is uh, someone that you know well, Adil Hash Khalil. Uh, he continues to lead the effort and So I want to thank him and his entire team. Uh, thank you. Th th very good. Okay. Yeah, come here. Adele, Adele, why don't you come up? Say a few words. Good morning. Good morning, Los Angeles. This is a great day. Um, <clears throat> to address our future issues, challenges in Los Angeles, to make this city a great city that it is, we need to have three things innovation, integration, and collaboration. And this IRP has brought everything together. And the example of what we're seeing in Los Angeles is because of your support and leadership combined with this innovation, integration, and collaboration. It takes a family to make this happen. What we're seeing in Los Angeles, in South Los Angeles Park, under leadership of Councilman Perry, in, in uh, uh, North Valley, in Elmer Green Street, we are changing Los Angeles to a better place, to a place that we can be proud of, and I'm proud of what we have done and a lot more work to be done. But this recognition shows that we are leaders in this country, we are the best, and Los Angeles is the cleanest, greenest city in America. Thank you. We've got a couple uh, members who'd like to add their good wishes to Mr. Rosendahl first. You know, we have these presentations every Friday, and many of us are multitasking and a million other things and barely paying attention because of the reality of our job. But when the moment I saw Ms. Perry go up there, and I saw you, Enrique, get up there, and I looked around and I saw a lot of familiar faces, I said, what is this all about? And I listened to the entire presentation. And let me say this, having been chair of public works for a minute or two when I first came on the council, and right now seeing huge bulldozers over in Penmore Park uh, creating another opportunity where the water through that area can go in, get cleaned, and then go into the ocean. You did it over in my Mar Vista Park, the same other kinds of com concepts. But the overall commitment of making this the cleanest, greenest, uh, uh, less wasteful water user in America is awesome. And, and I just can't tell you, and Ms. Perry, you have stayed focused, disciplined, and you wouldn't give up on these issues until this moment here right now where we see the presentation happening. So my hat's off to you, Ms. Perry, for your leadership, number one, and my hat is off to the bureaucracy that functioned like, you know, like a nice fiddle. I mean, it was, it's been very nice for me to see what you folks have been doing. So hats off to everybody. God bless you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Labange. Thank you very much, Mr. Garcetti. Appreciate all that you have done. But Ms. Perry, what you've done is the chair. And you look around, and it's like a pinball of great people who work for the city of Los Angeles. Uh, and I just want to thank each and every one of you. I know most of you personally. Yesterday, Mr. Rosendahl, I was out at the airport touring the wonderful modernization that's taken place there and talking to the workers. And when I talked to the workers, I told them about the history of Mulholland and those who built this city. Because, Adele, it's not just the three or four things. There's only two things you need. You need water and relationships. Clean water, which you're trying to make out of water, because all water is recycled. All water comes. It doesn't come from anywhere but from nature. And we have to protect nature. But water and relationships, and now the relationships we've developed uh, through the variety of organizations is becoming, I hate to use this term, mainstream to be caring about this. So I just want to rise, especially for all of you that I personally know and have watched our careers rise together from either in City Hall or outside City Hall. So it's, it's a good day today. And again, Ms. Perry, you got to got a big smile because this is making this is bringing good health to all people because it is all about water and relationships. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Reyes. Uh, thank you, Council President. 
colleagues, yesterday we had a momentous occasion where we turned around a Bronzefield site, a former dairy site, and we were able to complement a substandard park that had been there for decades. And the last time any park improvement occurred in Lincoln Heights, I think, was in 1896, when Lincoln Park then was known as East Lake. It was the boundary of the city. What is significant, though, is the change, the change in the culture of Bureau of Sanitation. Thanks to John Perry's leadership and her role, Enrique, and all of your generals, uh, your sergeants, your lieutenants, Everyone that goes to all the meetings has been able to understand what other cities are doing, and now we're at the cutting edge. I think 10 years ago, we had these discussions, and it was getting this blank stare like, what are you talking about? What about pots and plots in Berlin? What about recycling? What about, I mean, it, it was a curious look, but it just seemed to me that in places where you have 30, 40, 70,000 people per square mile, kids stuck in stairwells because they have no place to play, that we can create multi-purposes on one site. So tomorrow, hopefully, we can gain the kind of support, we can finish that project, and in the future look at how we look at the substructures along the properties along the river, where we can capture the stormwater, we can use stormwater harvesting technologies, we can reinvigorate our ecosystems, and actually introduce that which is natural as part of our recycling and cleaning programs. And it starts with Bureau of Sanitation, the yeah. Department of Water and Power, the family, the city family that's making it possible. So I just want to say thank you so much for your hard work, your dedication, and your courage to explore something different. And hopefully we can capture the air rights of these properties and find other revenue streams to make this city a much stronger city in the future. So again, thank you so much. Each one of you, I oh, think, are the unsung yeah. heroes. Yeah. I've been to your department. I see all the plans on the walls and your cubicles. I drive there by, that, by at night. I see the lights are still on. People are working hard. And this day and age of cutbacks, you're still there making it happen. So thank you so much, and keep up the good work. Congratulations. Mr. Krikorian. Thank you, Mr. President. This is a, a very important presentation. And Ms. Perry, I'm really uh, very appreciative that you brought this forward because, uh, and I first let me say congratulations to you on your, your leadership in this area. This is one of the great untold policy victories uh, that people don't know about. Uh, and the, the, I, the degree of success that we've had here in Los Angeles in conserving water is, uh, is really a tremendous victory. We now, in Southern California, we now conserve more water than we import from the Colorado River. And, and I, most people don't have a full appreciation of the magnitude of what that means. What it means in infrastructure that we don't have to invest in. What it means in terms of money that we save that we don't have to spend on expensive imported water. What it means for uh, our impact on global warming and on our carbon footprint because fully one-fourth of the electricity that's generated in the state of California is used to move or treat water. And the more we conserve, the less impact we're having on, on climate because of uh, reduced uh, electricity use as well. So um, this has been a huge success. And it's, it's one of those times when um, people have come together with a vision for how we can do it better. And that vision has really been made a reality. And so I want to applaud uh, certainly our city staff for its diligence in making this work so successfully uh, and, and your sustained vision, your sustained effort uh, in conserving water. It's, it's extraordinarily important to our future. There is going to come a time, probably within our lifetimes, uh, when struggles over water supplies are every bit as important globally as struggles over oil. And that, that day is coming. In some places of the world, it is already here. And this city's future, this city's ability to survive is going to be dependent upon our having sustainable, uh, certain supplies of water. And we can only do that with continuing commitment to conservation. So thank you very, very much for all your great efforts. Thank you, thank you Mr. Krikorian. And
I'll join the chorus just very briefly as well. I got the emails back and forth, amazing uh, to see not only the application, but as we are going through, and then the winning of the prize was a very proud day for Los Angeles, and I think as, as you see evidenced by the number of council members who are speaking on this issue, we're changing fundamentally the way we deal with water in the city. Um, the green streets, the lid um, ordinance, the LA River, the Propo, cleaning up the Valley Aquifer. We are changing the way we interact with water, and you know, it's in these chambers, if you watch uh, Chinatown, uh, that, that famous scene with the horseshoe the other way facing in, they're talking about bringing water first to Los Angeles. That might have been a uh, fictional account, but it was a real piece of history. Today, we're writing a new chapter, and we're cast a, we've cast a new scene here. And congratulations to everybody for making that turnaround. It's really been an amazing group effort and a well-deserved honor. So congratulations to, to all of you and to Los Angeles. Mr. President, I want to just let you know that uh, on October 17th for that week, uh, Los Angeles will be hosting the largest water quality conference in the country with over 20,000 water professionals coming to Los Angeles to learn about what we do here in Los Angeles and to learn from the leaders of water in the country. So we we'll ask you to join us. I know Councilwoman Jan Perry will be with us, but we'll be here in council for a reception that would love to have you on, uh, on uh, October 17th. So thank you. All right, we'll go in the back. Thank you very much. Okay, okay. Appreciate it all. Congratulations, everybody. And uh, if I could, Mr. Zion. Here's, here's a link on my info to myself. Yeah, let's run through the agenda real quick, and then we'll, begin, we'll do our pre special presentation for Council District 15. Colleagues, if uh, we can call the roll, Mr. Clerk. Haller, Concardness, Englander, Wizard, Koresk, Gregorian, LaBanche, Parks, Perry, Reyes, Rosendahl, West, and Zion, Garcetti. Twelve members present and a quorum. Mr. President. First order of business, please. Approval of the minutes. All right. Mr. Zion moves and Mr. Weston seconds. Without objection, those will be approved. Next order of business. Commendatory resolutions for approval. Mr. Gregorian moves and Mr. Wizar seconds. Without objection, those are approved as well. We can uh, run through the items on the agenda today. First items, please. Very good, sir. Items one and two are items for which public hearings have been held. Committee reports for items one and two have been submitted and distributed for council's consideration. There is a request from a member to continue item number two to Tuesday, October 4th. Okay, without objection, we'll continue item number two. Item number one, Mr. Parks. I'm in the motion that we'd like to. Okay, we'll hold that. Uh, next items, please. Mr. President, items three through six are items for which public hearings have not been held. Ten votes are required for consideration. All right. Any objection to consideration? Seeing none, those are now before us. Items three through six, do we have any cards on those? Mr. President, we do not. Okay. We'll close the public hearings. Any members wishing to call three through six special? Three through six. Seeing none, let's take up the balance and open the roll. Close the roll and tabulate the vote. Twelve ayes. Those are approved. Next items, please. On the continuation agenda, items 7 through 16 are items noticed for a public hearing. Okay. Do we have any cards on those items? Uh, sir, we do not. Okay. We'll close the public hearings. Uh, any specials, colleagues? 7 through 16. 7 through 16. If not, let's go ahead and open the roll. Close the roll and tabulate the vote. Twelve ayes. Those are approved, including the ordinances on the first reading uh, due to 12 members. Next items, please. Items 17 through 27, are, uh, excuse me, are items for which public hearings have been held. There are requests from a member uh, to continue items 19, 21, 22, and 23 to Wednesday, October 5th. Okay. Any objection to continuing uh, 19, 21, 22, and 23? Seeing none, we'll continue those until the 5th. Items. So uh, pardon me, sir. Yeah. Items 17 and 18 are commission appointments. Would you like to hold those? Yes, on the please. Desk? Let's hold those. We'll take those up uh, first right after the presentations. And any specials? That leaves 20, 24 through 27. Any specials from those items? 25 from Mr. Rosendahl. Uh, any other specials? Seven at the desk until it's circulated. Okay. Mr. Rosendahl calls 27 special as well. So let's open the roll on 20, 24, and 26. Please open the roll. Close the roll and tabulate the vote. Twelve ayes. Those are approved. Next items, please. Items 28 through 33 are items for which public hearings have not been held. Ten votes are required for consideration. Okay. Any objection to consideration? If not, those are before us. Do we have any cards on any of these items? I'm oh, sorry, Mr. Corcoran? I, I need to call 31 special, yes. please. I'll call that special. Make sure. Um, do we have cards on Mr. any of these? Mr. President, we do. We have cards on 28. 
31 and 33. Okay, we'll call those special. Further, on item 32, no action is required in as much as the uh, item was adopted on Tuesday's meeting and inadvertently scheduled. Okay, we'll take no action on 32. That leaves 29, 30. We can open the roll. Close the roll and tabulate the vote. 12 ayes. Those are approved. Next items. Mr. President, items 34 through 36 are items scheduled for closed session. Uh, would you like to hold them on the desk? Mr. Parks, what is your advice on this, Mr. Chairman? Wednesday, okay. at 35 and 36, I'd recommend that we have an open session. There's worker, worker comp cases that are on statutory. Okay. Fine. There's no objection. We'll continue item 34 until uh, October 5th. We can go through the settlement proposals on uh, 35 and 36 right now. Very good. Uh, recommendation uh, for 35, there is a recommendation for settlement in the case entitled David Perry versus City of Los Angeles through stipulated awards in an aggregate total amount, uh, total settlement amount of $103,243.50 after taking credit for $54,259.14 in permanent disability advances. The aggregate new money payout will be $48,984.36. Sense. On that matter, open the roll. Close the roll. 35. Tabulate the vote. Too late. Twelve eyes. Next item, please. For uh, item number 36, there is a recommendation for settlement in the case entitled William Orndorff versus City of Los Angeles through a stipulated award in the amount of 63% permanent disability or a total amount of $86,370.50 at the weekly rate of $230, less the amount of permanent disability advances of $33,069.89, which were paid. The total, the, excuse me, the, the total new money payout will be $53,237.61. On that matter, open the roll. Close the roll and tabulate the vote. Twelve eyes. Thank you. Next item, please. Mr. President, uh, that brings us to the special meeting. Uh, would you like to uh, continue with presentations at this yes, point in time? We will continue with presentations. Our next presentation, Councilmember Garcetti. Yes, Tom, Tom LeBond is going to join me too as, as our official music guy or co-official co music guy. It is a real uh, honor. Uh, to have a super uh, presentation on behalf of the 15th Council District here today. Um, as we declare September 24th, 2011, as Richard and Robert Sherman Day in the city of Los Angeles. And I am proud to be here with uh, a couple Shermans, but uh, indeed to honor Richard and Robert Sherman, who are um, legendary musical songwriters um, for so many movies for the melodies that have enriched our lives um, and when it gets to the list of some of the things that have been written uh, by the, the, Sherman, uh, the Shermans it's going to be an incredible list for all of us but we know that Los Angeles is probably the most creative city in the world and when we take folks who are uh, the embodiment of that, people who are in Los Angeles, come to Los Angeles, some of us born in Los Angeles, we know that we live in the, the happiest place on the face of the earth, but we also know too that it's a very small world, which we'll get to. So colleagues, on behalf uh, of the 15th Council District, uh, we are declaring this day. Um, the Sherman Brothers wrote more motion picture musical song scores than any other songwriting team in film history. Just listen to some of the scores of the Sherman Brothers. Mary Poppins, Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, The Jungle Book, and The Aristocrats, among many, many others. They've written numerous top-selling songs, including Your 16, which reached Billboard's Hot 100 Top 10 charts twice. First with Johnny, Johnny Burnett right. <laughs> in 1960, and then with a uh, Beatle. Oh, with uh, Ringo. Ringo. Yeah, exactly. Ringo. Then number one with Ringo Starr, exactly. uh, and Tom has been a, a great Beatles fan uh, for many, many years, more than 13 years later, an incredible accomplishment. Other top 10 hits include Pineapple Princess, Let's Get Together, and many, many more. And they wrote uh, a song that all of us know from our childhood whenever we go uh, to Disneyland, among other places, probably the best known song, It's a Small World After All, for the 1964 New York World's Fair. It is the most translated and performed song on the face of the earth. <laughs> Tom LeBange will be leading a sing-along later if folks want to, so please, please feel free to join him. 
In every language, exactly. In 1965, the, the Sherman Brothers won two Academy Awards for Mary Poppins, which includes the songs Feed the Birds and Supercalifragilisticexpialidocious, and the Oscar-winning Chim Chim Churi, um, favorites that have enriched and, and entertained us for decades. Since Mary Poppins premiere, the Shermans have subsequently earned nine Academy Award nominations, two Grammy Awards, four Grammy Award nominations, and 23 gold and platinum certified albums. An incredible accomplishment. So today, we owe a thanks to Linda Grimes, who is here with us, of course, the indomitable executive director of the Golden State Pops Orchestra, which is housed in San Pedro's beautiful and historic Warner Grand Theater, and which begun its 2011-12 season on September 24th with a spoonful of Sherman, billed as a fun romp through the Sherman Brothers songbook fe featuring favorites from classic children's films, Mary Poppins, Jungle Book, Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, and many more. As a pianist and a composer myself, I am truly thankful to the Sherman Brothers for uh, making our lives so enjoyable, for bringing us the melodies that we hum uh, on good days and bad, and for being a part of the fabric of the most creative city on the face of the earth. It gives me great joy uh, with Mr. Labonge, who I want to ask to say a couple of words to present this presentation we'll do in a second. Mr. Thank Labonge. Thank you very much, but I just want to congratulate, uh, you know, as an uh, elected official, a politician, you kind of know a microphone, okay? <laughs> Uh, but, but uh, and as a singer, you have a voice. I'm not a singer. But those who write are like great trees, great sequoias in California. Your roots are deep and they stay forever. And your words are uh, translated around the world. My favorite song is It's a Small World because as president of Sister Cities, it is absolutely a small world. And I'm not going to begin to sing any of the, that beautiful song, but I just want to congratulate you and your brother. You're a Norman from Beverly Hills High, a Southern California, uh, born and bred, yes. which is so special. And let's uh, hear it for the Sherman Brothers on this day, the 30th. Mr. Labonge, if you'll join me as we honor Richard, who is here in uh, Chambers, and we declare and we uh, commemorate the September 24th as Richard and Robert Sherman Day in the city of Los Angeles. <laughs> Well, uh, I'm, I'm thrilled, thrilled, thrilled beyond words to be here. I, my brother Robert lives in London, so unfortunately he isn't here with me, but spiritually he's standing right next to me thanking you all for this wonderful, wonderful honor. I, I'm deeply indebted to everyone here. I'm in, very much indebted to Linda Grimes, who uh, is the guru and chief uh, operator of the of the uh, beautiful orchestra that's, that's so celebrated our music, the Golden State Pops Orchestra. And, and here's Linda, please say something, will you? Well, I want to thank Council, and uh, especially for those of you that, like Tom and Eric, who understand the value of a theater that um, really is a nexus for our community. Um, the arts really do mean business, and it's an honor for us to uh, uh, recognize living legends as in the Sherman Brothers. And for me, the whole thing has been wonderful to get to know Richard a little bit better, and we thank you for, to for today. Oh. You're welcome to join us for any of our concerts. You can contact me, and we'll make sure that you get a good seat in this wonder, in our wonderful theater. Good job. And then just to close here with the Sherman Brothers, uh, Buddy Holly would have been 75 just on the 21st of September. Buddy Holly had 19 number one hits in the only a year and a half, uh, and, and 43 records uh, shot out there. 19 number one hits. But this music that you have. <laughs> Children around the world sing, like I said, you're very special. We're fortunate to be able to call this day your brother's day. Congratulations. Mr. Rosendahl. Mr. Oh, Rosendahl. Mr. Mr. Bill. Well, having had the uh, opportunity to grow up uh, during that period, now being 66 years old, that positive energy that always came out of your work <clears throat> really helped me uh, and we need a lot more of that in today's world that is so negative and nasty that if we had more positive, loving, hopeful, exciting, almost, you know, and sometimes, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're in a cloud on it and you're just giggling. As I was growing up, I was going through all that. So God bless you. Thank you very much for sharing it with us. Thank you. Congratulations and thank you very I, I'd much. I'd like to say you've got to thank Walt Disney, too, because he was our boss for so many years. That great, great man was our inspiration, believe me.
A wonderful tribute. Thank you, Mr. Garcetti. Mr. Thank Lamont. you very much, Mr. President. And let's all uh, celebrate with a sing along in about 10 minutes with Mr. Lebon. <laughs> well, have a sing along led by Council Member Lebon. All right, thank you. Our next presentation Mr. Wesson. Mr. Wesson. No, no, Mr. Wesson presentation. How about uh, Day of the Horse? All right, here we go. Right now, this is good. Let's hear for the horse. Uh, we got music. Mr. Lebon. Yeah, Mr. Kikorian. And, uh, Mr. Kikorian, Mr. Mr. Lebon. Please join me as well, if you would, please, right now. And I want all our great horse people to come here uh, and join around this great podium in the John Ferraro Chambers. Uh, I think there's more horses in the second district and the twelfth district. And here in the 4th District, a lot of them ride. Mitch, come on over as we start this celebration. There's a classic scene in the movie Chinatown where Jack Nicholson's sitting right there. He's playing J.J. Giddies in the movie Chinatown. And they're talking about the water department. And in walks a, uh, a herd of sheep. And they come right down here. Next year, if we could, Paul, let's see if we could get a let's couple of horses, horses to come right into the chambers. <laughs> But it's great to have you all here today on this very, very special day of the Day of the Horse, which will be October 1st, 2011. And as we just recognize the Sherman brothers, just think how much, Mr. Alicorn, thank you for joining us as well, how much horses has been part of music and how it has been uh, so much about our life and our culture. Here in Los Angeles, I'm particularly proud to have Griffith Park, which has 56 miles of equestrian trails. Uh, a lot of horses live in the North Atwater District uh, with our own LAPD equestrian unit, which is there, the Amundsen facility, which is a gift to the city of Los Angeles. Uh, and all of this is uh, transpiring as the work we're doing on the LA River. We're close to getting a bridge so horses could pass uh, clearly uh, and cleanly across the river when it's the mighty river on the few times that it is. But I want to salute the mighty Trojans, the USC and Traveler, and everybody's there fight on, which is good. And now, representing the second district of the city of Los Angeles, Paul Kikorian. Thank you very much, Mr. Labonge. And uh, this is such a great honor to be able to be here for the first day of the horse in the city of Los Angeles, a day that's really long overdue because throughout our 230-year history, uh, every day in Los Angeles has in one way or the other been the day of the horse. If you go back to our original founding as a city, when those 11 families uh, of the pobladores first established this city, of course, their very survival was to dependent upon the horse. Uh, throughout the 19th century, uh, our transit, our personal transportation, our public transit, our commerce was all dependent upon the horse. Throughout the early 20th century, as our heritage industry, the film and television industry, found its roots here, uh, it was primarily uh, about producing Western movies, also surrounding the horse. The Gene Autry, the great uh, contributor to so much of, of the culture of, uh, of this city, as, as Mr. Lavanch points out. Um, and then now, uh, in the 21st century, still, this is a city that has over 15,000 horses here. It's, a, it's an industry that provides over a billion dollars of economic activity here to this city. Uh, and it's also an industry and, uh, and a lifestyle and a culture that contributes so much to our uh, attractiveness as a tourist location and also to our quality of life. In my district, in the second council district, uh, we have many, many nonprofit organizations, uh, equestrian oriented organizations that make people's lives better, particularly those therapeutic and assisted therapy centers uh, that surround the horses. Groups uh, like the Valley View Vaulters, Special Spirit, Ahead with Horses, Shadow Hills Riding Club, Ride for a Cure, uh, the Summerhawk Ranch, and, and most recently, uh, and, mo and very importantly to me, the New Heaven on Earth Ranch, which is a continuation of uh, the work uh, that Johnny Carpenter started long ago to, to create an opportunity for uh, people with disabilities uh, to overcome those limitations because of their relationships with horses. And it's, it's magical when you see what a horse can do to transform lives. So uh, throughout our history, and right now, today, this city is, is, uh, should be very grateful to our equestrian community for all that it is uh, contributed uh, to what we mean, what it means to be an Angelino.
Thank you very much, Mr. LaBarge. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. And, uh, from the 12th District, a lot of horses out in Chatsworth at beautiful trails. Mitch Englander, rider Thank himself. You. Thank you. Absolutely. And I do, I do ride regularly and grew up riding. My kids ride. Uh, but more importantly, I think, well, Mr. Kokori, Mr. LaBonge took my notes, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to focus instead of on the, on the horses. We actually have Day of the Horse in Chatsworth. We've been having it for many, many years. It's a great way to outreach about public safety, how to share the road with horses. We've got some beautiful trails out in Chatsworth, and, and uh, as, as most people know, but I want to talk about the people that ride the horses, the equestrians, the people that are on the horses, the people that are fighting for open space, the people that are fighting to protect the nature and the trails and that maintain these trails over and above what the city is able to provide. Uh, the ones that are out there fighting to make sure that if we put in development that they have the proper trails in place to protect that as well and there's access. Uh, to the beautiful landscape in the San Fernando Valley and the rim of the valley and the city of Los Angeles. Uh, people like Mary Kaufman who not only do they fight to uh, protect equestrian keeping and uh, large animal evacuations and disasters, but then they also volunteer on all these other organizations like neighborhood councils. Uh, they volunteer on equestrian committees. Uh, the volunteer uh, on the Los Angeles Police Department has a mounted unit of volunteers, and many of these folks behind us volunteer with that. And that takes a lot of effort and training because you don't just take a wild animal like a horse that you can ride on a trail and bring them onto a parking lot with people and cars in public safety with everybody walking up to them and to make sure that everybody's protected. So I want to say it's the day of the horse, it's the day of the horse people as well. And let's hear it for our equestrian community. If uh, Mr. Ed was here, he'd tell you that horses are people too, so. And let me have the great councilman of the 7th District who has a lot of real, real, real riders. I remember Richard, uh, when I lived in Atwater Village, there was a, uh, a gentleman who used to ride the river, Ed, ride the river all the way up to Pacoima and to see his brothers and sisters. So, uh, Mr. Alicorn. <laughs> yeah, Pacoima is not, not known for horses, but in fact, uh, we have one of the largest equestrian centers uh, in the uh, in in the county, in at Hanson Dam Equestrian Center, uh, we have a tremendous uh, equestrian community that uh, contributes not only to uh, to fight for the open space and the recognition uh, that uh, that not only benefits the horses and the riders but also the general community against uh, over concentration of, of density in our planning process. And so many times it is the uh, equestrian riders who have protected the communities of, of the likes of Pacoima and Lakeview Terrace and the foothills uh, of Silmar. So I am very pleased to join with my colleagues. I want to recognize also the, the tremendous public safety effort uh, that Mitch uh, hinted to during the Sayre fires. Uh, many animals were saved when uh, people were told to evacuate. Many of these people stayed there right. to protect the animals and we moved them to Hanson Dam. When we had an a economic crisis, if you will, uh, sort of a manure crisis, uh, when uh, a business went bankrupt uh, that uh, hauled away the manure, uh, I worked with this community to make sure that our Bureau of Sanitation gave them a place to put their manure until all of that could be sorted out, if you will. Um, that was an ugly situation, to say the least. Uh, it, it, yeah, it stunk. Um, but you stepped right but in. this is a community. <laughs> I think you Sorry. stepped right into that one. Um, but uh, this community is, is very important to the Northeast San Fernando Valley. The one challenge we have is many, too many people do not register their animals and, and, and are not recognized by the planning department. And those of us who understand that dynamic uh, uh, do battle with the planning department to protect uh, the interests of the riding community. Uh, um, but it's a constant challenge. And that's one that, that the, the people that are here recognize and are constantly trying to inform those other riders who are not uh, registering their animals 
principles as to how that that unwinds the the uh, the uh, uh, beauty of the of the, the the elements that come with the writing community. So I want to thank uh, Tom for recognizing uh, this day uh, as a special day. We, you know, there's so much history when you look at Hollywood and you think of all those animals that they they were in Los Angeles. I don't care where they said they were. They were animals from Los Angeles. They're still here. Let's protect them. Let's preserve that that fabric of our community. Let's make sure that they they have a place in Los Angeles uh, for as long as Los Angeles exists. All right, and let it Mr. Weizar, followed by Mr. Garcetti, then Mr. Rosendahl. Well, oh, thank you, Mr. President. I just want to thank my colleagues for bringing this to our attention and to all the writers and supporters of our horses. Uh, this is an educational process because um, for those council members who do have equestrian centers in their district and know the issues involved with that and the balance we're trying to strike, uh, for many of us that don't have those equestrian centers, it's good to be here today to talk about that, to recognize that horses continue to play a very important role in our society. Uh, my bro three brothers, three of my brothers continue to ride horses. Uh, they are chados. Uh, I've been riding a horse in the Mexican Independence Day Parade the last three years and uh, been practicing quite a bit to, uh, to learn how to ride a horse. But it is a, a special relationship that one builds with your horse. Uh, my father would talk to me about the special relationship he had with his horse. And uh, he considered him another human being, like you said, Tom. And it's a special relationship we build with our horses. People talk about the relationship with our dogs and man's best friend, so to say, man and woman's best friend. Horses, I think, in our history have played the same type of role. So thank you for being here. I, I think this is wonderful uh, that uh, this was brought to our attention as a whole and that we're watching on Channel 35 so that we recognize the important role that horses continue to play in our lives. Thank you so much. Mr. Garcetti, followed by Mr. Rosendahl. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Usually this is a place with a lot of unanimous votes, but I think today the nays have it. Um, but anyway... <laughs> He, hey, we, hey, hey, he's a Rhodes Scholar, we, uh, San Fernando Rhodes. Uh, uh, thank you, Dom. And I want to thank Gene Gilbert, especially. Um, Gene Gilbert does an amazing job. Uh, Enterprise Farms, uh, Caspian Horses, which are extremely rare. Uh, the training, the work that she has done as well to preserve an equestrian district that we are so happy to have worked together on, also with Mr. Labonge in North Atwater Village. One of the happiest days of, of my life here in Los Angeles was an uh, evening when I was invited to the Saddle and Sirloin to speak about L.A. history. And we kind of visited and we were talking about what it was like in the old days in Los Angeles. And after the talk, me and my father, it was a father-son ride, we got on, on horseback and it was right after about a week of rain in, in Griffith Park. And so the park was just green and lush and beautiful. We rode all the way up to the top and the entire way up it could have been 300 years ago until you reach that crest and right at sunset you see this incredible city spread out like diamonds in front of you. And it was the most magical evening. And we know the impact that horses make not just through the direct connections that people have with them, but whether it's something like Taking the Reins, which is a great program in Outwater Village that teaches our at-risk youth. There it is, right there, Taking the Reins, which I've been a proud supporter of. It takes girls who sometimes don't have the confidence or have never seen their world expanded and through the relationship with a horse and with each other learn how to be uh, amazing members of our society. And that is really what makes us special, that we can be a city that still takes that past into the present and I know with all of you into our future too. So thank you and congratulations, Tom. Thank you. Mr. Rosendahl. I was pretty good about nay there. Um, let me say a few quick things. First of all, I'm blessed in the 11th district to have those wonderful mountains. And we, we have uh, River Road and other places where people, all of a sudden you're off of sunset and you see the horses grazing and you see the sensibilities that just flash you into a more positive space. On a personal note, uh, my niece Teresa, uh, you can't separate her from her horse. I mean, it is totally a relationship uh, like I have with dogs and cats that is unbelievable. My most uh, exciting experience, frankly, was running the Red Mesas with the Navajos without even a saddle and just going across the field with them, a horse they gave me to ride, and then my own personal sense of tying close to that horse and realizing they understand a lot more than a lot of people uh, don't know. And they, they, you can actually work with a horse with the same concept that you work with any other animal like a dog. So I, I, I'm absolutely thrilled we're honoring today. And God bless you all for everything. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Riz. 
you know, when I look at this great culture, the byproducts are, are amazing. <laughs> to have horse paths, trails, to have environments where the horse could be calm, could be part of that experience. There's a multiplier effect there. That means more environments for more people. To be able to have places of solitude, places to have uh, relief from the hustle bustle of this great city. And for that, I thank you. But also, there's a big historic factor here. In the charros that are of Southern California, the great history of our region, uh, where we develop many of our talents and skills as we go through history, uh, it's something that we should amplify. So I just wanted to ask, how many charros do we have in the group? We have one over here. Right there. Well, hopefully in the future we can have that ability to share the culture of the charro with the traditions that you have maintained through this great discipline in training horses and keeping horses healthy. And to be able to show the younger generations that within that culture there's a lot to be celebrated in our traditions, in our multilingual Spanish and English. Uh, my godfather's a charro. And as a kid from the inner city, we went out to Pacoima. And, and there was, there was, a, there was a, uh, a ring out there, and the charros came out and all of their, it was gallant. They had their, their full outfits, the horses, they were dressed up. It was beautiful. And it just amazed, and the memory I'll always have. So that's something we need to share. And I, and I thank you for making sure that this city is responsive. Uh, I've been through all the land use battles that you can think of, going back to Burnside. I know some of you don't smile about that. But I do know that we create balances, we create agreements and compromises. But the fact is, we need to honor the great traditions you bring. And for that, I thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Reyes. Mr. LeBond, that yeah, completes. And, and Lynn Brown here is a great constituent who lives in Hollywood but loves oh, horses. Yeah. She spends. Uh, yeah. uh, and, uh, I'm going to ask Lynn to say because there's some very beautiful people here, uh, not only dressed uh, as they are dressed every day, but tell us a little about who's with us today. Okay. I want to thank you all for uh, all of City Council for honoring us with this proclamation. Uh, I'm a member of the, I'm the Vice President of the Equine Advisory Committee, which most of you people have sent uh, re representatives to. Our committee reflects the wide panoply of horse users from the Latino to the people in Compton to people all over this area. And I want to, they are all here today. I want to thank all these people who went to so much trouble to find the parking place, to get here, to put on the clothes, and to show up. It's a wonderful thing. Thank you. Lenny, they just tied up their horses at the first street there on the trees. Mr. President, I'm proud uh, to join all of you and our Mayor Antonio Villaraigosa. Uh, to represent Griffith Park and Sunset Stables, which has a great ride uh, up there. And I think Richard has a good idea. We should have a council ride. So maybe one year at Sunset Stables, one year in your district, move it around the city, get out to Ascot. Today's the day of the horse. Tomorrow. So let's hear it for the day of the horse. All right. Congratulations, day of the horse. Thank you, Mr. Lavange, Mr. Very Englander, much. Mr. Alarcon, Mr. Kikorian. Thank you all. Congratulations. And we will now move on with the rest of our agenda. Mr. Clerk, next item, please. Mr. President, that would bring us to the commission appointments. Commission appointments up. Bring them forward, please. And those are numbers? 17 and 18, sir. Uh, they are different. You can take them individually. They are from uh, different commissions. 17, we have public comment card. 18, we have public comment card. Mr. Sachs on both. So let's uh, have the commissioners come forward. We will have the... Uh, Ms. Kerry Morrison, Los Angeles Homeless Services Authority. Ms. Morrison, good afternoon. Good morning. And we will turn to Mr. Rosendahl. Mr. Rosendahl, please. 
Uh, thank you very much. Um, and it's good to see you here, um, Carrie Morrison. Um, tell us a little bit about your background. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Good morning, members of the City Council. Uh, my name is Carrie Morrison. I am the Executive Director of the Hollywood Property Owners Alliance. And I have been managing uh, the Hollywood Entertainment District Business Improvement District since 1996, when we first, yeah, 15 years, when we first started the uh, Hollywood Renaissance story. Excuse me, Ms. Morrison. Ms. Mor excuse me for a moment. Ms. Sergeant Arms, we're still conducting the meeting, so we need the folks that are celebrating to quiet the celebration, please. We are still in session, still conducting this meeting, so we want to give due respect for this uh, nominee. Thank you. Thank you. Please continue. Thank you. O over the course of that 15-year history, obviously, as we often find in business improvement districts where we're trying to revitalize our downtown commercial core, we have had uh, a lot of uh, issues and concerns raised over the years relative to homelessness. and. Uh, I have personally become committed over the last seven or eight years to actually playing more of a leadership role in our community. I think we came to a sea change in Hollywood where we recognized that government was not going to solve this problem, the social service sector was not going to solve this problem, that we actually needed to bring the community together, including the business community, to link arms and uh, make a commitment that ending homelessness in Los Angeles is doable and is something that we believe in. So I am thrilled to have the opportunity to represent the city as a voice on the LASA Commission. And we're thrilled you raised $50,000 from the private sector quietly to show that partnership and put your money where your mouth is and got things going. That's the kind of leadership I like. I got a big problem in Venice. I have hundreds of people sleeping on Venice Beach. They're from all over America. I'm trying to open up a, a winter shelter earlier on the 20th of October, a 50 bed unit. It cost me 80 grand. I put 20,000 in it. I've been talking to the mayor in Kanabi and to Yaroslavsky about supporting me. Some people say we want permanent housing supportive services. So do I. But we need to do a multi pronged approach. Those on Venice Beach, I'd like to give them a, a good sleep uh, with clean sheets and a, a meal and, and a shower and then some wraparound services so we can help these people. Many of them are, are young kids in their teens running from dysfunctional homes. Literally, I was there 4 o'clock in the morning uh, with some community leaders, and there were many folks sleeping on the beach. Some of them were also resistant to services. I, I met a fellow who was in Vietnam, who, who was a POW, who doesn't want the VA, too many rules. So we have challenges with various homeless people. But it breaks my heart that I don't have a shelter open right now on the west side. Your thoughts about a shelter on the west side, I could use it permanently. You know, we might be a high class, rich, uh, ocean view kind of spot, but there are a lot of homeless from all over the country that come there. Your thoughts on a, a winter shelter opening now, and my cooperation I need from the city and the county that seems to be lacking. Well, I, I, I share your concern. We, we have wanted a winter shelter in Hollywood also for all these many years, and we don't have one either. Uh, we have 51,000 people sleeping on the streets of Los Angeles. We certainly have a, I'm sorry, 51,000 on the streets of the county of Los Angeles, about 23,000 in the city of Los Angeles. We certainly do have a commitment, I think, as a, as a policy community to begin to move this, uh, this big system to supporting permanent supportive housing but we don't have it yet. So in the meantime, people still are sleeping outside. And uh, I understand the issue that you're facing. Uh, I think in the interim, we do need to bring people inside. And, and uh, winter shelters now are beginning to actually engage folks to start the process of case management and introducing to them the concept of moving on. Uh, I will tell you that we're going to try to cobble together a small shelter in Hollywood for 35 people, just the most vulnerable, because it's ludicrous in this society that we expect people to sleep outside in the winter. I, I think it's an anathema that we have gotten to the point where we somehow think this is acceptable. So I, I appreciate your leadership in trying to help these people. We have a lot of the same concerns in Hollywood with young people and others being um, attracted to our community. In our recent homeless count, we did a full enumeration and found 780 in the core part of Hollywood. So um, absolutely, uh, Council Member, I'm, I'm committed to helping you in any well, way. God bless you and thank you for stepping up. You'll bring a, a great new energy to that 
board. Uh, I'm extremely grateful, and it's a pleasure having you before us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rosenthal. Mr. Garcetti. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rosendahl. And I want to thank the mayor. This is, of, of the nominations that I've had over the years, this is one of the ones I'm most excited about and one of the best nominations that I've seen a mayor put forward. Um, and I want to personally just tell the story uh, of uh, what this individual has done, uh, Carrie, not just in the cleanup of Hollywood and the turnaround of, of a geographical area, but the way that she has brought together, I think, a partnership that is unique to the city. Um, in making sure that we address in one neighborhood and now hopefully throughout the county with your leadership uh, the issue of homelessness. As we looked at Hollywood Forward and, and bringing together national and local and private resources, she's been a voice, oftentimes the business community has been seen as, oh, they're ones who just want to get rid of the homeless so they can see the property values go up and other things. But I think from a very personal place, a place of faith, a place of, of your own um, beliefs, as well as for all of us who meet these individuals and know that there are some that are literally on the verge of, of death and those who are just entering homelessness, be it a foster kid that for the first time is spending a night um, on the streets or a woman like I met two months ago who was outside my district office with her son having spent one night in shelter uh, far away from Hollywood but trying to get her kid back into school so that he could be at Helen Bernstein the next day. Um, Carrie Morrison has really helped us lead the way and make sure that we humanize each of these faces. We'll never, when you hear the 23,000 person thing, we'll never be able to comprehend that or absorb that. But when we have 23,000 stories and individuals and names and we realize the veterans and the youth and folks that are there for a whole host of different reasons, those who have child care issues and drug abuse issues, those who have, need job training, we can personalize and get people off the street. And as we showed in Hollywood, you know, one hospital visit from one person we were able to take off the street and put in a scattered site um, a project that we have for like 12000 or 15000 a year with services versus $200,000 in a couple visits one month to our emergency room. So um, I'm very committed to, and I, I hope we can work together on um, trying to go back to voters at some point when we have better economic times. We nearly passed Proposition H, which would have brought a um, billion dollars for affordable housing, about a third of which would have gone, gone just into homelessness. If we don't invest in the short term, we are going to pay so much in the future. And um, I don't really have any questions because we talk so often about these issues, but I just am extraordinarily overjoyed to see you here and know that you'll be serving us and take that, that um, acumen of bringing together this coalition and make it countywide. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Garcetti. Mr. Labon. Absolutely a great nominee by <laughs> Mayor Viragosa, as passionate and as committed as anyone could be on this issue. Kerry Morrison has been a, a partner in Hollywood with the business community and the social service community. Well, you don't see that as often. Sometimes they, they don't work at odds. And under Mr. Garcetti's leadership, this is all moved to make a difference in all the lives. Strong support for Kerry Morrison. Great job. Thank you, Eric, for all you've done in Hollywood. But you couldn't have done it without the work of Kerry Morrison, both on the clock for the Business Improvement District and on the heart for the people in need. Kerry, congratulations. We're looking forward to your Arnold Sachs. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Good morning. Congratulations on your appointment. Um, just very quickly, I have an interest in a homelessness situation. Do you know if anybody from the commission was at the Los Angeles County Commission on Local Government Services in June or, Ju June or August? You know, they had the Los Angeles homeless uh, on the homelessness on their agenda, the, including the update on the county's plans. So I'm wondering how you're interacting with them. We had the discussion on the homeless prevention and rehabilitation rehousing program. What is the city's views on the, the VA property in West LA? You know, there's claims that that should be better utilized to house veterans. So I'm wondering, because that seems to be an essential problem with homelessness and vets, that that property is not being used properly. And it's not like that's a new property. So why isn't the LA City Homeless Authority more active in pursuing the county to move on that? Thank you. All right, with that, let's take a vote. Open the roll. Are you nervous? Close the roll. <laughs> Tabulate the vote. 11 eyes. There you go. Congratulations to you. Thank you. You are confirmed. Mr. Rosendahl? Number eight. 
15, uh, if we could uh, have support for that gentleman for that commissioner's job. He was here last Wednesday. He could not make it today. We vetted it in, in discussion in the committee. There was tremendous support for him, and I'd like us just to move forward with, with that appointment. Mr. Clerk, we have number 18 before us. Uh, we do have a public comment card on number 18. Mr. Sachs, recommendation from Mr. Rosendahl, so we do approve that to the Transportation Commission. Yes, thank you again, Arnold Sachs. Um, based on what's been in the news recently about the, the uh, court ruling striking down the independent driver's um, requirements at the Clean Air, the Clean Truck Program, wouldn't it be prudent for the Department of Transportation or the Transportation Committee to look into maybe doing the same thing they do with taxi cabs? I mean, taxi cabs are now franchises. So couldn't they request that the truck drivers become franchises? They're all independent contractors, as are the taxi cab drivers. Nobody actually works for a company. Couldn't they become franchises and run the port just like they do the cab companies? You know, you buy a city seal for your truck more money for the city's general fund and you're a franchise, you're an independent contractor and you have to abide by the rules that way. It works for the cabs, ha ha ha. Why wouldn't it work for the truckers at the port? Thank you. See no one in the queue. Recommendation by Mr. Rosenthal to approve this nominee. Open the roll. Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. Eleven ayes. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Rosendahl has asked that number 27 be uh, moved forward. So on number 27, open the roll. Uh, pardon me. Before voting, sir, uh, for clarification, we do have uh, an amendment on the desk, 27A. Uh, it has been circulated. Uh, it's authored by Mr. Rosendahl and seems technical in nature. We do have a card on that also on the amendment, uh, Arnold Sachs, on number 27. Then we can do that one. Mr. Sachs. Thank you. Good, good morning again, Arnold Sachs. Two things about this item on the agenda. Um, you know, there's no um, CRA money involved here, and there's no, um, which is interesting because this is in a blighted area, so there would be no CRA money involved. But my, my actually comment is um, they're going to pay, they're going to pay uh, on part five of this, they're going to pay. Uh, Unexpended funds for stop sign controls in District 11. Um, they're going to pay money there, and then they're going to pay for a consult consultant for other traffic calming measures. Oh, they're paying overtime to the DOT for stop sign controls. Why are you paying overtime to the DOT to discover stop sign control and then paying additional funding to a, a consultant for other traffic calming measures? You're duplicating the process, spending money leading nowhere. Yeah. All right, thank you. On that matter, open the roll, close the roll, tabulate the vote. 11 ayes. Mr. Clerk, next item, please. Mr. President, that takes Council back uh, to uh, public comment uh, for items not on today's agenda. All right, public comment time. Arnold Sachs, public comment. Yes, thank you. Good morning again, Arnold Sachs. Today's front page of the LA Times, Friday, September 20th. It just doesn't stop. Hundreds of patients overwhelm the ER at LA County USC Medical Center every day and night. The good news is none of those patients are under the influence of the living wage ordinance of the city of LA because they got an extra $2 an hour to buy their own health care insurance. Wonderful idea. That just doesn't make sense. And what happened to the leaders? Oh, well, she's now in the county, in the, the, the government in Washington, helping there. I'd like to also question this, uh, make some remarks about the zoo privatization and the fee increase that occurred last week. You know, it's really kind of amazing that 
You have the request for proposal discussion, the privatization discussion, you have budget discussions, and no mention of the $2 fee increase, although it was discussed in committee, no mention on the council floor, chamber, council floor until after you decide, well, we have this request for proposal, then two months later we'll decide to inform the public that there's a $2 fee increase included. So if the request for proposal is for $100,000 or, or based on 100,000 visitors, that's $200,000 that is generated by the $2 fee increase. But that's not addressed in the request for proposal. That's like an extra $200,000 going back to the person who's going to run, win the bid. How does that work out? This is exactly what happened with the library. We need to pass this item on the uh, voters. Where will the money come from the general funds to operate the library? Well, we'll discuss that at a later time. Thank you. Noel Great Weiss. Leaders. Mr. Noel Weiss. Council, good morning. Um, for purposes, I, I noted with interest, uh, Mr. Englander was on the radio saying that he wants more courtesy to be exhibited by the city employees toward the public. However, during this public comment, we have Mr. Englander talking to Mr. Garcetti, Ms. Perry in the peanut gallery over there talking to a constituent, Mr. Gregorian talking to his staff. I think, honestly, with all due respect to this council, you owe it to the public to listen to the public, even if you're just pretending. Now, with regard, there's some issue about uh, Herb Wesson recently with regard to uh, a matter that came up. Uh, he's trying to get some CDD funds for some people in his district. You know what? Perfectly appropriate. As far as I'm concerned, the merits of it, it's open, it's transparent. And I've got to confess, too, because we're talking about making the system work for the people. Herb was really helpful to my little special interests, which are the tenants of this city back in 2007 when Chuck Tenen and I basically got Herb, or Herb basically said, you know what, I want to try to take care of this problem. And he found $5 million in a CRA account that basically helped finance the, the transfer or the ability of tenants to be able to finance people like Chuck Tenen places when they were being evicted involuntarily in, the, in that speculation boom. That's an appropriate use of special interest. And you know what? It happened in two weeks, people. It shows you what can be done when people make up their mind. But then we have, on the other hand, uh, Mr. Koretz in a matter, and my time is running, but in a matter basically where now he's trying to use a legislative, uh, a, a judicial function to basically legalize uh, a project which is going to come before the council on Tuesday, 1100, 1102 Stearns. It's unlawful. It's illegal because it's a, basically a, a, a dwelling unit in violation of the R1 zone. The, the people did it. They know that they did it. An architect bought the property. He had probably overpaid. There's a tenant in there. He's entitled to relocation fees. And Mr. Koretz, the same ace guy, administrative code enforcement, um, and this guy came by way of administrative code enforcement, but he, but he wants to get the rest of this council to validate that act. And you know what? If this council does it, it's the wrong thing to do because we've got to basically rely on the laws. Um, more on Tuesday. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mario Brito. Good morning, uh, members of the City Council. Uh, President Garcetti is not here, I guess. Where is uh, my City Council member? Oh, there you are. Uh, where is Reyes? Ed? Estoy ciego. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm a resident of uh, Los Angeles, uh, 3236 Griffin. The reason I'm coming to you today is I don't know if you are all aware of what's been going on in, in Wall Street. Uh, these young people have decided to talk about the wealth inequalities that's going on in this country, where 99% of the nation's wealth is in 1% of the hands, where people, we're, we tell our young people, uh, I tell my son, he's 14, go to college. He's going to go out of college, going to have $100,000 in debt when he gets out there. Where are the job opportunities? You know, Wall Street got bailed out Why Main Street is getting sold out. Um, these young people are going to be outside of City Hall tomorrow. We don't want to protest City Hall. We feel that it's important that people understand why we're there. We're going to be there uh, occupying the plaza or the sidewalks to demonstrate the importance. And we hope to have, if we're allowed to, to have tents that clearly say, we, have, we sleep in tents, you sleep in mansions. It's important that we talk about this issue of wealth inequality in this country. And I'm also letting you know that, unfortunately, 
the city police department has been very uh, uh, inconsiderate and has actually threatened to arrest anybody who sleeps on the sidewalk on this protest. We've attempted to work with them. We've asked them, let's come up with a solution that works. They refuse to have a solution that works. We have our attorneys meeting with, their, with the city, city attorneys, but I've come to you today to, say, to ask for any of you who want to come join us on Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, join us, please. Let people know that you're behind us. I know that every single one of you are, believe in economic justice, and this is what this country needs is an economic bill of rights. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Our final public speaker, Cheryl Eichley. Thank you for the... Um phonetic sound on that. Thank you very much, Council. My name is Cheryl Eichley. You're used to seeing me in front of you in regards to medical cannabis issues. Today I'm here regarding the Occupy Los Angeles. You've heard what's happening in Wall Street. It's happening in major cities all around this country and in the world. Tomorrow we begin our occupation at City Hall. We are not uh, protesting city workers. We will be here under our First Amendment right. I don't know how many people will show up. Um, we've had general assemblies for the last week. Today is the seventh day we've met. We do an open, direct, and participatory democracy. We go off a of consensus and we make decisions. Our group has made the decision, the consensus, that we will be nonviolent. We have uh, points of unity that bring us together because we all have very different backgrounds and very different social concerns. We will not be able to take the South Lawn tomorrow because there's already a permanent event for um, community policing. There will be police and FBI and whatnot having an event on the South Lawn. So we will be hopefully taking the steps on Spring Street and being very orderly on the sidewalk and whatnot. We plan to be here indefinitely until we can get change in our government. We are worried about the um, corporate greed and its influence on our political process and how the average citizen is not, voice is not being heard in the political process and the processes that dictate our lives and affect our daily lives. We're letting the council know today now so that you're aware so that it doesn't get sprung on you. Um, we will be on the South on a Mon on Sunday and possibly Monday. There are other events that are permitted. We're very happy to accommodate the other events and not interrupt them, but we will be here. There will be people spending the night on the cement or on the grass. The LAPD did tell us that they would arrest us if we did that. It's our understanding that homeless people get the right to sleep on the ground from 9 p.m. to 6 a.m. every morning. We will be doing the same. Thank you. Thank you. That completes public comment for today. Mr. Clerk, next item, please. Mr. President, that takes council back to items called special. All right, next one up. Uh, item number one. Called special for Council Member Parks. Uh, Parks. It should be noted that uh, motion 1A has been uh, distributed and uh, is now before council. Mr. Parks? Yes, just want to uh, uh, ask that we support 1A as an amendment to this report. Basically, uh, we've been struggling to get the South LA office fully funded uh, after the transfer of funds from CRA to the city. Some way those funds came up missing, so we wanted to uh, go back and ask that they be uh, solidified and also that there be strong consideration that we keep that office in play uh, for um, uh, a period of time, which is the five years. The one thing, uh, that office uh, uh, handles nine uh, project areas uh, and currently uh, in, is underdeployed and underfunded, and so we're trying to give them some stability. Thank so. you, Mr. Parks. Mr. Reyes? Uh, thank you, Council President. I was hoping to have this conversation uh, on the side, but uh, Council Member Parks, would, it be, uh, would you be amenable if we could have one-year reviews of, of, of 1A? Should there be any uh, resources left over uh, the whole river project area? Yeah. If there's yeah. anything that surplus? The thing is, is that you're saying can come in for an annual report? Right. I don't have a problem with annual report right. as long as we can move forward. And again, we've, uh, this is something in which if without this, there would be no South LA region. Oh, absolutely. And yeah. I, I think that's important. Yeah. But, but should no, there I be have no, the occasion? I have no problem asking them to come back annually and report on it. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Thank you, Mr. Reyes. Mr. Cardenas, and welcome back. 
Yes, thank you very much uh, for pointing that out, Councilmember Reyes. Uh, in effect, that's what his, uh, Councilmember Parks' effect. In effect, that's what his amendment will do. We will have the opportunity to address it on a year to, by year basis, even with Councilmember Parks' uh, amendment. So, I just, as the chairman of the committee, um, everything seems to be in order. Thank you for that amendment, Councilmember Parks. It is in order, and I just ask for your eye vote. Thank you. All righty. On that matter, colleagues, please open the roll. Specifically, to clarify the committee report. The Correct, Mr. The committee Parks. Report. Committee Thank report. You. As amended. As amended, as amended by one A. <laughs> Open the roll. Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. Twelve ayes. That matter passes. Next item, please. Mr. President, that brings us to item 25, called special for Councilmember Rosendahl. Mr. Rosendahl, 25, sir. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, I've, I've asked Tom Rothman to come up from the City Department. You know, we need to let the public know as things move along that they're moving along especially those who ride bicycles, really care about the future. Remember we did a five-year bike plan the other day? We're actually moving in the direction now. We're going to be creating every year 40 to 50 miles of bike paths, and we'll do it over the next five years. Uh, we realize as a city now that it isn't just the automobile, it's the mass transit, it's the pedestrian, and the cyclist are all ways for us to get around. In my particular neighborhood, I see a lot of skateboards running around, too. So that's a form of transportation, uh, as well as our feet, as well as our bicycle. But when you get on that bicycle and you want to end up at, at another place, you need a place to put your bike that's secure. You need to feel the same comfort that a, a person with a car goes into a lot and feels no one's going to vandalize them or cause issues. And that is an issue for us. So if we're taking this seriously, we need to do this. But colleagues, this is just a step. What we'll do here today, we'll go to the city attorney's office, and then we'll come back with a final ordinance for all of us. But I'd like you to explain, if you could, Tom, what this is and how this moves us forward on our bicycles. Certainly. <clears throat> Thank you. Tom Rothman, the planning department. Um, the, uh, the uh, council approved the bike plan back in March of this year, and this is the planning department's first implementation ordinance for the bike plan. So what we're doing here today is um, we're expanding where and how our bicycle racks are installed throughout the city. So this is an effort to incentivize bicycle riding and a way to encourage bicycles as a primary mode of transportation. As the councilman said, we need to have places to lock our bicycles up when we get to our destination. I'm just going to go over a few of the uh, details of the ordinance and you can ask me some questions. What we're doing is we are going to expand requirements now to, to uh, residential buildings, to the larger residential buildings. Right now we have no requirements for long-term and short-term parking in, in, uh, in uh, multifamily buildings. So we're going to be providing that in this ordinance. We're going to be increasing our bicycle parking requirements for other uses like commercial and manufacturing buildings and retail. We're going to expand which types of buildings, the size, so we're going to go to buildings under 10,000 square feet, whereas the cutoff right now is over 10,000 square feet. And we're going to expand bicycle parking to city-owned properties and parks. Right now there are no requirements for those buildings, so this is, you know, you go to a park, you need a place to park your bicycle. Um, the ordinance also contains some very basic design standards to make sure that we have some attractive bicycle racks. We're going to um, have clear rules for where these bicycle racks are sited. Um, and we're going to make a distinction between short and long-term parking, which is very, very important for our residential building. We want to have a very secure places for long-term parking. So when you live in a building, you don't have to worry about vandalism or theft. And then some short-term parking so that people can visit you and have a place to lock up their bicycle when you visit. So those are generally the, uh, the, the, the main points of the ordinance, and uh, we hope that we can bring it back for a final approval soon. This is wonderful, folks. This, it's a good day as we move forward with implementing the bike plan. Uh, do a shout out to Ray, because it isn't just oh, yes. us government workers, you know. It's our interns. It's other people who play a major role. Yeah, we had a great intern from... Uh, UCLA helping us on this ordinance. His name is Rye Berg. He did an excellent job. He can't be with us today, unfortunately, but he will be here the day uh, hopefully this is adopted by the full council. Thank you, and, and thank you, colleagues, for listening to this. Uh, obviously, if you have any questions, uh, please ask them, and I, I look for an I vote to move forward to the city attorney's office uh, to work on the fine print and bring it back to us as a final ordinance. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Mr. Reyes, followed by Mr. Wiesart. Thank you, Council President. Uh, uh, colleagues, I want to thank Councilman Krikorian, Councilman Wiesar, Kim Plum, 
to review this subject and uh, got us to this point. The staff for their hard work. Uh, in terms of what to expect, I've got a litany of things here, but can you just quickly just say in real terms, what does it mean, additional bike racks? Uh, can you just speak to some of the detail that allows the audience who are listening what they can expect? Certainly, for all new projects and uh, for some changes of use, we are, will now be, once this ordinance is adopted, be requiring uh, a substantially more bicycle parking in all of our buildings, re residential, multifamily, I th we, uh, for, for residences with four or more units, will now be required to provide a certain percentage of, of long-term and short-term bicycle parking and more racks that are uh, easily accessible and visible to the street for all of our commercial and manufacturing buildings. So there will be an increase in what's required today. We have very minimal requirements there and they only address commercial and manufacturing buildings. Now we're going to expand that. So should, uh, in the future, if we were to mimic what other countries have done, other cities, we have public access to bike facilities in busy intersections and in transit centers where bikes are made available by using a credit card or being able to pay at a booth. They can pick up a bike and drop no. off a bike the scale of these racks would accommodate such a facility? It, it could com uh, definitely accommodate those types of shared bicycle. This is The shared bicycles are not part of this ordinance, but uh, the ability to incorporate those shared bicycle parking ideas into these new bike racks uh, would certainly work. Great. Thank you. Congratulations. Thanks. Mr. Wezar. Thank you. I, I just want to congratulate the Planning Department and uh, Councilmember Reyes, who's the Chair of Plum, and others who have worked on this. This is an incredible step forward. We often talk about how we would like our city to be a lot more bike friendly. We've adopted some large policy uh, direction, but this is really getting us to the beaten bones of what needs to happen in, uh, in order for us to move forward. Uh, what I like about this as well is that we're recruiting bike corrals. Um, you know, we got the first four bike corral in the city at York Boulevard and. Council District 14, very successful effort. Uh, but when we first proposed that, there was some um, not quite enough understanding about how to go about it. And now that we could codify it, understand it, I think it would be a lot easier to get more of them. But uh, I want to thank you all because I think this is a giant step forward in making our city a bit more bike friendly. And I look forward to getting the ordinance so that we could uh, uh, move that forward swiftly um, so that we could uh, finally. Uh, get to work on some of these things we talk about here and there and there. It's all coming to one and this uh, changes to our ordinance. So thank you so much for all your work. Thank you. Thank you very much. That uh, brings the colleagues to conclusion. And we now take the vote. Open the roll. Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. Uh, Twelve ayes. Thank you. Congratulations. Mr. President, that brings us to item 28 called special for cards. Number 28, ladies and gentlemen. Arnold Sachs, number 28. Yes, thank you again. Good morning, Arnold Sachs. This is a very concise item on your agenda regarding um, relocation interests in land and certain infrastructure between Ultramar Incorporated, Air Products and Chemicals Incorporated, the City of Long Beach Harbor Department for the uh, new in hiring hall for the w Longshore and Warehouse Union. So I'm wondering, and I've asked this question, since you're so concise in this item on your agenda, could we get some pertinent information regarding the new stadium that's going downtown? We know the stadium is going to be built on the grounds of the convention center part that's going to be destroyed, but we don't know who owns the property where the new convention center, the new wing is going to be built. Is that city property? Is that AEG property? Who owns the property? Don't you think the public would be entitled to know you're so concise in this item on your agenda? Can't you be concise on that? Thank you. No one on the queue? Open the roll. Close the roll and tabulate the vote. Twelve ayes. Next item, please. That, that, Mr. Rosenwald, excuse me. 
28 forthwith, that's all. Forthwith, thank you, Mr. Rosenbaum. That brings us to item 31, called special for cards, and Council Member Kerkorian. Uh, two cards, Mr. Kerkorian? Do you want to yeah. hear that first? Uh, no, Mr. President, if I, I may, okay. um, uh, after an extended period of time working on this issue, I'm afraid I need to recuse myself today because I have purchased a home within the affected area, and so I'm required to recuse myself. Okay. Mr. Kerkorian will excuse himself? Recuse himself. And excuse himself, Mr. Reyes. Uh, if we can hear from the public first, then I can speak to the issue. Okay, Antoinette, B I C K, and uh, offer. If you want to come up together, go ahead. Do we each Ms. have two minutes? Go ahead, sir. Uh, I have two for each of you. Go I ahead. have a handout for the city council. I'd like it, it's essential that you look Sergeant at Sergeant Arms will get that from you, sir. Thank you. Yeah, there's more than that. One for each person. And the clock's ticking, so go ahead. Okay. Um, Article 3 of Chapter uh, 1 of the L.A. Municipal Code, Section 13.13b, sets out the rules for establishment of an RFA. It states that the RFA, Residential Floor Area District, shall include contiguous parcels, which may only be separated by public streets, ways, or alleys, or other physical features. Precise boundaries are required at the time the application for or initiation of an individual district is created. Uh, I'd like you to look at that drawing because you'll see that what's been chosen is completely non-contiguous. We have 4,000 homes, non-contiguous, hopping over non-R1, non-RE zoned commercial, in, zoned in commercial, industrial, R3 and R4. It's hopping all over the place. You can see the darkened areas are R1, RE. The other areas is where it's hopping over. It's non-contiguous. The, the municipal code requires that an RFA is, an, is contiguous, and the reason for that is to, to create smaller areas. The keyword is contiguous, and the proposed RFA stitches together some 14 non-contiguous neighborhood. Uh, I'm giving you this drawing so you could see the, uh, the distribution. Uh, the map clearly delineates the 14 non-contiguous neighborhoods shaded in gray, separated and non-contiguous from one another. My neighborhood bounded by Ventura Boulevard, Laurel Canyon, Moor Park, and Whitsett. Uh, smaller lots that are 50 by 130 or so on average voted by a margin of 3 to 1 at the planning department workshops against any RFA whatsoever. Yet the proposed RFA ignores the will of the people in our contiguous R1 neighborhood and it does so illegally. It's an illegally constructed RFA and the city council, if it truly believes in the rule of law, must vote to uphold the municipal code and strike down the non-contiguous and illegal RFA that has been created. We, we are... 14 or 15 areas. Good morning, council members. Um, section 12.03 of the Los Angeles Municipal Code is quite specific in defining residential floor area to include only areas that are confined within exterior walls and are covered by a roof and balconies that have an open lattice roof as exempt from a square footage count. Yet the Studio City RFA proposes a new definition of the residential residential floor area that will now include exterior uncovered areas in the case balconies. Balconies are, are an exterior, exterior area never imagined or intended to be dis, defined as floor area as part of the BMO or under the building codes for that matter. Ironically, the proposed balcony regulations violate the BMO itself, the very law that permits an RFA. Secondly, an RFA under the BMO can be created to regulate square footage, not design. The proposed RFA regulates the design of all balconies, regardless of square footage. This is blatantly illegal under the BMO. The City Council has the legal authority to create an RFA, but not to change or override the BMO. The proposed balcony regulations violate, conflict with an attempt to override the BMO, as well as violating Los Angeles Municipal Section Code 12.0. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Mr. Reyes. Thank you, Council President. Can I ask our planning staff to, to the table? Colleagues, this is one of those uh, experiences that does take time to address. If you look at the map, it's a, a range of locations. And at the outset, I believe there was around 200 individuals who were against this process 
and its uh, goals, it's down to two. O over an 18 month period, there was about eight community meetings. But I wanted to ask Mr. Glick if you can address some of the points that were brought up by the two individuals and if you can speak to the integrity of the process and what is before us in the most uh, layperson's terms. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. Tom Glick, City of, Lo City of Los Angeles, City Planning Department. Um, as the councilman indicated, um, this RFA did not take an easy route to this place today, um, but at the end of it, the, uh, the process did work where the communities that were in opposition ended up agreeing to the final proposed ordinance that is before you today. And the ordinance that's before you today is before you to be referred to the city attorney for form and legality. That is important in the context of the, the speakers who have spoken today um, because if there is a concern about the way the process was done in terms of the legality, the city attorney will be working with the planning department to ensure that that legality and those legal issues. My understanding, based on our reading with, currently with the city attorney, because this issue was brought up at Plum two weeks ago, is that the RFA was prepared consistent with the requirements of the Los Angeles Municipal Code. Okay, I do want to take a moment to uh, congratulate Councilman Krikorian and staff for this hard work. Consensus building is very labor intensive. Uh, it's crucial to absorb every perspective, but eventually a decision has to be made. Uh, the due process was followed through form, legalities, and so I, I encourage and I vote. And, and, and one, we started this process with an understanding from the previous council office, which was Councilwoman Gruel, when she initiated the motion uh, almost three years ago that um, there was a consensus in the community. This was a, an overriding concern that the mansionization of single family homes in the non-hillside non areas of Studio City was a major concern. When we got to the Planning Commission in, in February of 2010, um, there were several, several hundred people on opposite sides of this approximately 50-50. The council office, once this came out of planning commission in September of uh, 2010 with a proposed ordinance that was, was somewhat closer to consensus, the council office spent the next year doing a wonderful job in, in building the consensus where we are down to two people who are opposed to this process. So the process worked perfectly, it was exactly the way it worked, and it was primarily because of Council District two's, two's efforts. Thank you, Mr. Glick. Thank you, Mr. Labonge, followed by Mr. Cardenas. I think it's important in this process, she said, the process, there's two people who really are adamantly opposed to it. But the character of our neighborhoods is what makes a city a champion. And I know the other day there was a story in the paper that we're like 17th in the country, and traffic congestion, but I bet you we're close to in the top three in the country in great neighborhoods. Studio City is a great neighborhood. It's only going to be greater because of this type of land use, which is key, because that's the only thing that we have at the end of the day in the neighborhoods and how we do the right thing. So I want to thank the Planning Department and thank the Second District, Mr. Kikorian. Thank you. Mr. Cardenas, our final speaker on the queue. Uh, Council Member Reyes. Um, how many community meetings did you say they had? At least how many? I believe it was uh, over eight. Okay, at least eight. At least eight in an 18 month span. Okay, Th thank you very much. I just wanted to uh, thank all of the staff for your hard work. Some of the meetings that we have are in the community. I know it is part of our job, but it's really hard to have that level of due diligence when we're cutting back to try to be as efficient as possible with the taxpayer dollar, but to be able to give that kind of attention and effort to an item such as this, I think I just want to commend the staff and again, Council Member Krikorian and you as well, Council Member Reyes, through your committee process to make sure that we are as fair as possible. And to hear that there was that much opposition at the beginning and to see the opposition, still some, but Ma magnitude-wise, much, much less than the beginning of the process. I think it goes to show to, to the professionalism and the ability of us as a, 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 a government responsibility organization to be able to do that with that kind of diligence. I just wanted to point that out. This is all in light of the fact that 
with the ERIP. A lot of our more experienced, experienced uh, staff are now gone. We're now depending on newer people that are, seem to be stepping up and putting themselves in a position where they are being responsible and effective. So I want to thank you. Make sure you let all the staff know that you're working with, again, uh, to the council members and their staff and everybody involved. Thank you. Thank you, council. All right. This uh, matter is now before us. Mr. Reyes, you recommend an I vote? Yes. There we go. Colleagues, open the roll. Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. Twelve ayes. Okay. If someone can retrieve Mr. Kikorian. Mr. Mr. President, Clerk. that brings us to item number 33 called Special for Cards. Arnold Sachs, number 33. Thank you, Mr. Kikorian. Yes, thank you. Arnold Sachs, item 33, 11 pre-qualified on-call contracts for environmental documentation and environmental specialty studies. And point number two on this uh, agenda item says, instruct the Bureau of Engineering to prepare a semi-annual report to the CAO on the consultant usage related to this rotating list. So I'm wondering if this is a new set of instructions, because this is an amendment to change the contract from five years to seven years. And all 11 consultants would have been picked at the start of the five-year contract. So why wasn't the instruction given then at the start of a five-year contract instead of the end of the last two years? It says also that they're all going to be able to conclude the tasks that they're now working on. Well, if they're going to conclude the tasks, then the contract should read not two years, but until you complete the task. Because if you extend it for two years and they start on another task, then they're automatically up for another extension on a new contract. Unless that's the way you really want to operate. All right, thank you. The matter is before us. Open the roll. Close the roll and tabulate the vote. 13 ayes. Mr. Clerk, next item. Mr. President, would you like to recess the regular meeting and go into the special? I'd be delighted to do that. Very good. Uh, Alarcon, Cardenas, Englander, Wezar, Caress, Gregorian, Labanche, Parks, Perry, Reyes, Rosendahl, West, and Zion, Garcetti, 13 members present, and a quorum, Mr. President. All right. Item forward, please. Item 37 is an item for which a public hearing has been held. Very well. See no one on the queue. Number 37. Open the roll. Close the roll and tabulate the vote. 13 ayes. Next item, please. Item 38 is an item for which a public hearing has not been held. Ten votes are required for consideration. Uh, Mr. Sachs on number 38. Uh, Mr. Cardenas, uh, Mr. Sachs, and then you'll yeah, get to you. Done. All right, thank you. So, Mr. Sachs and then Mr. Cardenas on this 38. Well, this is a wonderful coincidence. Arnold Sachs. I'm reading from the bottom here. Continued from council meeting September 28, 2011. No quorum left on desk. And who's going to speak? Mr. Cardenas, Councilman Cardenas, who once before in the city council chambers brought before the rules of decorum for the council regarding staying in the chambers. Mr. S Mr. Sachs, that's not the item. Please. No, 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 no. The here. item states no quorum left on desk. I'm discussing the quorum item. That's not item. what 38 says. Uh, it says right there. It's so, community redevelopment agency, sir. I, I, I'm, I'm discussing the... So just address your concerns to the community development, please. That's what we're I'm talking about. I'm reading the item as it's addressed on the, on the document here. No okay, form well, it's about community redevelopment agency authorizing the chief executive officer. And, and the whole agenda item says continued from the council meeting it's on continued, September... It's continued, sir, but that continuation means we're discussing the item and you're <laughs> spinning the clock as you're debating this I'm matter. Spinning, so if you want to get to the point... This. If you want to get to the point of community development agency, you're more than welcome to, sir. Well, I, I do, but I, okay, then go you, ahead. How can you? How can I get to the point if there's a? You lack can. Of a I'm quorum. giving you the opportunity as your time clock there's a, continues. There's a lack of a quorum, and I'm trying to. There's no lack of a quorum. We do a, have a quorum, sir. We sir, do have a quorum. You know, we, we, you have a quorum now, but you don't have a quorum then, and you didn't. Well, have a we're not on talking on about then, sir. We're talking about now. We're talking I'm about just trying now. to discuss what's on the agenda. All right, Mr. Uh, Sachs, your time is up. No, 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 I still have 41 well, seconds. Well, I say it's left, up, sir. you're done. Mr. Cardenas, go ahead. Go ahead, Mr. 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 Uh, Cardenas. Mr. Sachs, I'm cutting your time off. You're done. Thank you. I just cut it off, sir. Go ahead, Mr. Cardenas. Thank you. Um, Back to the issue item uh, 38, I just wanted to 
uh, ask that we receive and file item 38. Thank you. Herb Saganum? That's fine. Mr. Cardenas, I'm sorry, I was distracted by a I'm colleague. Sorry. Yes, receive and file item 38, please. All right, the recommendation is receive and file. Colleagues on number 38, open the roll. Close the roll and tabulate the vote. 13 ayes. Very well. Next item, Mr. Clerk. Mr. President, do you wish to adjourn the special meeting and return to the regular? Yes, I do. Council has motions for posting and referral. Post and referred. There are excuses on the desk. The excuses. Bring them forward, please. Councilmember Kerkorian requests to be excused from Council on October 11 due to city business that meets Council policy. That is approved. Councilmember Parks requests to be excused from Council on December 13, 14, and 16, and January 3, 4, and 6 due to personal business that meets Council policy. And that's approved. Happy New Year to Mr. Parks. Councilmember Alarcon requests to leave at 11 on November 15 due to city business that meets Council policy. And that's approved. Councilmember Englander requests to be excused from Council on December 6, 7, 9, 13, and 14 due to city business that meets Council policy. And that's approved. Councilmember Cardenas requests to be excused from Council on October 14th, November 18th, December 9th, and 16th due to personal business that meets Council policy. And that's approved. The desk is clear. Colleagues, announcements. Mr. Rosendahl. Mr. President, um, if you want to get down to Venice Beach this Saturday, October the 1st from 10 to 5, we have Recapaloza, which is devoted to youth. It's an annual festival of competition-based sports and activities for ages 6 through 17, designed to promote health, fitness, creativity, and achievement. Recreational activities include basketball and handball tournaments, skating, bicycling, fitness obstacle courses, kids' play area, food truck court, job fair, and much more. So if you want to get down there, have fun, and also look for job opportunities from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. this Saturday at Venice Beach at 1800 Oceanfront Walk. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Mr. Wiesar. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And I'd like to invite everybody to the 13th Annual Eagle Rock Music Festival Saturday between 4 and 11 on Colorado Boulevard one of the largest outdoor music festivals in the city of Los Angeles. Uh, we expect, believe it or not, about 100,000 people to walk through that music festival at some point. Lots of great musical acts. Uh, come out and enjoy the beauty of Northeast Los Angeles, listen to some good music, and overall, a great atmosphere. Saturday from 4 to 11, Colorado Boulevard in Eagle Rock. Thank you, Mr. Thank President. Thank you. Mr. Parks. Thank you, Mr. President. I'd like to uh, ensure the community is invited to the um, Debbie Allen Dance Academy uh, performance this evening, Friday, September the 30th, 7 p.m. at the Baldwin Hills Crenshaw Plaza. Uh, the public is welcome. Also, the 8th District uh, bi-monthly community leadership meeting will be tomorrow, 9 o'clock on Saturday at the, con at the uh, Constituent Center at 8475 South Vermont, and that starts at 9 a.m. And then the, our urban hike uh, with the LamertParkBeat.com We'll have a two-and-a-half-mile uh, hike along the corridor of Stalker. Starts uh, Sunday, October the 2nd, 10 a.m., and the meeting will be at Presidio in Stalker. Thank you, Mr. Parks. Uh, Mr. Garcetti. Thank you. Um, I join a number of folks on the council, Mr. Kokoyan, Mr. Labonge, and others, uh, to celebrate the opening of Pacific Standard Time, which is an unprecedented collaboration of museums and art institutions and galleries community arts organizations around the Southland who are coming together for the next four months to celebrate uh, 20th century art in Los Angeles when LA became a center of modernist movement in the arts world. Um, this Sunday, all museums will be free. This Sunday, all museums in the city of LA that are taking part in this, which is almost every institution, will be free. And the great thing about Pacific Standard Time is that uh, when you go to one place, there's going to be ambassadors there who tell you about another place. Go to a, a great uh, exhibit in Boyle Heights to learn about the Chicano arts movement in the uh, second half of the 20th century. From there, you might be thrown to a great uh, exhibit that's in Orange County or a gallery that's in uh, Miracle Mile uh, from LACMA to MOCA, Getty, etc. It is going to be an unprecedented um, art celebration throughout the entire city. And, and Sundays, all those museums are free. Really appreciate the city, the county, Getty uh, um, Trust especially, who really made this possible. And I'm sure Mr. LeBond has some 
things to say about it as well. I think it's uh, very important. You should look at that. All mu museums are free on Sunday, but also art in Los Angeles, uh, Pacific Standard Time. We thank the Getty and everybody involved, including our own cultural affairs department. In addition to that, uh, thank you, Mr. Garcetti, Mr. Zion, this weekend in Southern California. The United States Sister Cities International had their conference in Riverside on the western United States in the Pacific Rim, which I will attend at Riverside uh, tomorrow morning, uh, as well as tomorrow evening in Mr. Weizar's district, uh, where uh, the Italian Americans will celebrate uh, their culture on the birthplace of Los Angeles. A busy weekend for all. Enjoy it and uh, check out the art. Any other announcements, colleagues? I have a couple uh, Sunday, 11 to 6, the West Hills Fall Fest, 2323 3, 3, 3, Satakoy. That's the end of Satakoy in the West San Fernando Valley, West Hills Fall Fest. Everyone's invited, a wonderful opportunity at Fields Market, right across from Chaminade in the West San Fernando Valley. Also, I want to give congratulations to Joe Andrews and Katie Sanchez, who are going to be married this Sunday. Congratulations to Joe and Katie. They are going to be united in marriage this Sunday. I will be performing this ceremony. So with that, colleagues, Mr. Alicon? Yes. <laughs> Mr. Gikorian, they're off to a rocky start. Well, I hope not. <laughs> uh, um, I, I want to... Uh, announce to uh, the broad Los Angeles audience that we are having a child safety fair at the new uh, neighborhood city hall in Pacoima at 13520 Van Nuys Boulevard. This is a child safety fair that we will distribute 100 uh, free car seats. We will have child safety workshops. The Chivas USA soccer mobile will be there. Radio Disney will be there. Um, also uh, uh, Children's Hospitals Pedestrian Safety Program, uh, otherwise known as Richie's Community, will be there. And so it's going to be a great day for child safety in the Northeast San Fernando Valley. Secondly, I want to announce at the same time there will be a program at the Panorama City Neighborhood Council, uh, Fiesta Panorama. The event will be located uh, on Vesper Avenue between Parthenia and Chase Streets. It will feature live entertainment, food, crafts, and food trucks. Uh, and the, some of the sponsors include New Directions for Youth, the Filipino Chamber of Commerce, the Filipino American Chamber of Commerce. There are two different Filipino Chamber of Commerce. Uh, and a number of others. So it should be a, a fun day in Panorama City and a safer day in Pacoima. Thank you. Mr. Englander. Am I on? All right. Yes, on you are. This Saturday, uh, we've are. got the Valley Disaster Preparedness Fair at Fire Station 87. And where all the neighborhood councils, community-based organizations all come together. We have a great time. We cook. I'm going to be cooking this year hamburgers once again. I won. I won the cook-off last year, and I plan on winning again this year. Where is 87 located? On Balboa in... Uh, in and then fixes in on Balboa Boulevard. Then the uh, all right, Balboa and what? So Bal people know Balboa and Devonshire. All right, Balboa and Devonshire. Then on Saturday night, I'll be I'll be attending a wedding for, and I will not be officiating this wedding for my cousin Josh Englander. But many of you know and have worked with him uh, when he was used to live out here in California, and he worked in Sacramento as well. Uh, and now he works with the MTA in Washington, D.C., so I'm very proud of Josh and Whitney. And then on Sunday, we have uh, our Pioneer Day event at the Acre in Chatsworth at Chatsworth Park South, and I will be judging a chili cook-off contest as well. And so we urge everybody to come down for that. Thank you. Thank you. Any other announcements? Seeing on any adjourning motions? Any adjourning motions, colleagues? We do have adjourning motions. Please stand. Mr. Garcetti, adjourning motions. Please stand. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Um, it is with great sadness that I ask that we adjourn in memory of a friend, um, probably known by a number of people around this horseshoe, um, who passed away um, late Tuesday night, Wednesday morning, um, Andre Pineda, who was only um, 46. Um, a brilliant man, a true friend, a warm spirit, 
a loving human being um, who early Tuesday morning died when he took his own life. He was, it's an incomprehensible uh, occurrence that, is, that has happened. Um, for those of us who knew Andre, I spoke to him about it, uh, 10 days ago. He was somebody who had the most incredible advice, uh, the most loyal friendship. Uh, many of you also probably know his wife, um, Araceli Ruano, who runs the Center for American Progress office out here. And the two of them have been enmeshed in, in democratic politics for many, many years. Um, Andre is uh, somebody who worked for all sorts of campaigns. I think he started in the mid-1990s um, in uh, D.C. He was um, somebody who had worked closely with the Obama campaign, uh, helping uh, do polling and outreach into the Latino community. But while he was a Latino, he always was uh, uh, insisted on making sure that folks didn't ever hire him as a Latino consultant or to look at the Latino community as one monolith, but that uh, politicians and campaigns would look at the diversity inside the Latino community as they would inside any community and to understand that. He always was a bit of a contrarian, but with the smoothest and nicest way would give you advice that you had never thought about. Um, but somebody who loved life. He mentored so many people, students, um, fellow consultants and others, um, loved traveling the world. He was a one-man team who would uh, do his own polling, his own cross tabs, his own analysis, and um, would then sometimes uh, let you know that he was doing that from a beach someplace uh, around the world. And he loved nothing more than traveling the world with, with Araceli. Um, we have lost an, an amazing uh, spirit. The service will be tomorrow morning at 9.30 on, uh, in um, Pasadena at the uh, Holy Family Church. Um, at one, um, sorry, at 9.30 tomorrow. And uh, Andre, we miss you. The outpouring has been um, just incredible to see how many people's lives you touched. But this world has been made much, much sadder with the passing of Andre Pineda. May he rest in peace. Thank you, Mr. Garcetti. Colleagues? Seeing no other adjourning motions, Mr. Clerk, please call the roll. This concludes this meeting of the Los Angeles City Council. We'll return next Tuesday. Los Angeles, have a lovely weekend. Good afternoon.